After the Mopla riots, Gandhi advised that um, essentially, even though uh, the Hindus had been butchered, the best thing they could do was forget it. In order to keep the peace between communities, Hindus essentially had no right to strike back. Uh, so then Ramana Maharishi is silent and then he turns his head and opens his eyes and looks at Paul Brunton. And Paul Brunton writes that in that moment when the master looked at him, he felt all his questions disappear. And there were no other questions left. And you know, see, is, even as I see it, it's giving me good, say this, it's giving me goosebumps. But is there nothing redeeming about Nehru or Gandhi? Mm. Or is it that enough time has passed mm. and because they've been in limelight for so long, mm. even the skeletons are coming out of the closet? So somebody once went up to Patel and said, you know, you deal with all these business people and money and all of that. Gandhiji is not happy about this, you know, because this is not dealing with all these capitalists and so on. So Patel said, Gandhi is Mahatma. I am not Mahatma. I have to run the party. So taste, what we call taste is only the final frontier. But taste is a byproduct of aesthetics. Aesthetics is a byproduct of wisdom. Because what is aesthetics? Aesthetics is knowing not only what you want to consume, but what you should consume. Yo, what is up my friends? Welcome to another episode of Dosecast. My name is Vinamra Kasana. In case you're not subscribed to the podcast or don't follow it on Spotify, please do that right away because we release new episodes every Tuesday and Friday at 12 p.m. Indian Standard Time without fail. Today's guest and today's conversation is a landmark in the history of Indian podcasting. It's a landmark in the history of this podcast at least. I've had the pleasure of hosting Hindal Sen Gupta on the podcast. He's the author of 11 books. He's a Shevening scholar. I'm just going to read out his education and then his background to give you an idea of the kind of depth you're about to expect. He did, a, uh, he did an MA in mass communication from uh, Jamia Millia Islamia. Then he was a Knight Big, Big Hot Fellow in Business and Economics at Columbia University. Then he's a Doctor of International Relations and Affairs at the Geneva School of Diplomacy and International Relations. Then he's also done an, MM, he's also done an MSc in Modern South Asian Studies uh, from University of Oxford. He started his career as a principal correspondent at CNN, IBN, CNBC TV 18, then, then an associate editor at Bloomberg UTV, then a senior fellow at Center for Civil Society, then at the ORF, Observer Research Foundation, as the senior fellow, then he also served as the chief economic research officer at Invest India, the primary investing arm of the Indian government. He's also a young global leader at World Economic Forum. He's also an advisor at World Health Organization, WHO. He's also spent 14 years as the columnist, editor at large and senior editor at Fortune India, one of the most coveted magazines in the world. Right, he's also a columnist at the New Indian Express, columnist at First Post, co-founder of Global Order, and very recently co-founder of Grin, which is an online platform on the intersection of science, spirituality, entrepreneurship, and the foreign policy and globalization platform. The list of his achievements and accolades are endless, and the conversation is around taste, luxury, political Hinduism, Narendra Modi, Vajpayee, Nehru, the usual suspects, but done in a way that will blow your mind. The conversation with Hindal Sen Gupta around his book, Soul and Sword, The History of Political Hinduism, and many, many other rivetic topics begins in 3, 2, 1. Um, uh, so it's, it's only after that that uh, I began to get interested. And then once I realized key. My reality as a Hindu, yeah. first of all, is very unarticulated. Sure. Right? Um, yeah. It's largely carried out through rituals and mm -hmm. I only have to refer to my faith or my culture when I'm in a dilemma of sorts. Yeah. Right? Um, but then I realized that I am the anomaly because unlike me, many younger people, yeah. and you mentioned this in the book, like younger yeah. people who are like aggressively trying to understand their yeah. Hindu identity um, are are way different than I am. And, and yeah. they, they know. You know, 10 years ago, I wrote a book called Being Hindu. Yes. I, I kid you not, almost every week, I get a message on some platform by someone of your age, yeah. slightly younger, slightly older, you know, within a band, yeah. writing to me saying that they read the book 
and they loved it and they t- you know taught them so much and whatever and that book almost did not get published finally won the wilbur award it's you know that wilbur yes, award that mentioned yes. that's being hindu it almost didn't get published in india because publishers were like oh why should we publish a book on hinduism there's that it was a like it was really hilarious but it's been 10 years we're about to celebrate you know it's 10th uh, anniversary next year and uh, yeah i mean you know it's, so this this kind of hunger is absolutely there yeah yeah and so much so that um, it's gaining such a wide foothold yeah that you know even if i have someone who's going to explain the gita or yeah. the mahabharat there are people fighting in the comments um and this was these were uh, genres that were largely taken up by people who are much older than us our parents yeah. and grandparents yeah. i are exactly. i mean i still i say it and i get so much hate for this my understanding of the ramayana and mahabharat are fragmented stories that my father told me I never actually picked it up never mm-hmm. found a reason to pick it up um and the full ramayana that i ever saw was yugo saku's ramayana the mm. the animated ramayana and it's so beautiful it's so good it's so beautiful it's so elegantly shot the yeah. the music the yeah. it's so imagine that so as a generation of non ram 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 charitmanas readers and uh, not in, even engaging with the secondary research around this all of a sudden we're in this world where yeah. everyone is talking about this but there's a reason for that and if you want we can discuss this in sure. our conversation so that's a very good question i think we're at a very interesting juncture so the next question to this is why yeah. you know why are so many people suddenly interested right mm. why do they care you're right i mean um i also grew up in an india where you know people i mean especially the young people didn't bother so much about yeah. religion and stuff and they were far more interested in all the things we were talking about you know which brands yeah. to buy how much money to make which job to have you know where to go for a date all of these things yeah. right but there has been a sea change and you know culturally there's been a sea change but there is a reason for that and there is historical example in other parts of the world where this happens right right um you know even the film that you mentioned you know the japanese ramayan right why is it so beautiful you know the our question is how did this japanese filmmaker come to india pick up this text and was able to really understand its emotions Mm. You know what is beautiful about it animation is beautiful sure yeah but it really gets all the nuances of emotion yeah and you know, this is after japan japan doesn't really have a devotional god at its center no right no. i mean they've made anime they've come i'm being very ignorant but they've also made samurai stuff yeah. right they've made martial movies yeah. martial anime movies yeah. but not necessarily anything with gods at the center though japanese culture is full of like in in hinduism there are gods for everything right there are lots and lots of these deities you know mm-hmm. uh, so one uh, book i recommend to you which you might enjoy uh, do you read pico ayer's work i have i just read uh, the sample on kindle pico yeah. ayer in iran right yeah i forget the book, name of the book but his it's his uh, whole journey to iran he's staying at a hotel a bunch of things happened yeah so he'll read a book called uh, or read the Jap- japan books of his you know one is called the lady and the monk uh uh-huh. and the other is called um, autumn light okay um there so bikoyer basically first goes to japan as a time magazine journalist but then subsequently uh, becomes the partner of a japanese woman who in fact leaves her sort of marriage that didn't work and there's a lot of really beautiful descriptions of japanese everyday living you know why do the japanese do what they do mm-hmm. right and when you read it you'll realize this is so similar to india why was uh, so i i only discovered pico ayer because of uh, vagabonding by rolf potts it's yeah. the art of long term world travel at a yeah. time when i was contemplating that yeah. so i did some of that in spain and in the uk for two months and he recommended reading pikoyer yeah. because the number of times he's quoted pikoyer in the book uh, surpasses any other author so i actually picked it up and i realized it must be so wonderful to be a travel journalist and travel the world yeah. and y- y- it's like your life is your writing in yeah. any other genre you have to pick a field that is some yeah. sometimes dry or have to pick up a genre but travel writing also inevitably embeds you inside the story so i found that very interesting So we can talk about Pico Ayer also. You yeah. know, I discovered Pico Ayer. Huh? We are rolling. I know I we are rolling. Yeah, I I sprung that upon you. They they yeah, they started the my the cameras. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, you know, the interesting thing about Pico Ayer is that, you know, I, when I was a, you know, student and um I picked up Pico Ayer because I was a young journalist 
And one of, one of his f- first books that made him really famous is a book called Bid- Video Nights in Kathmandu. Yes. Right? And he sort of goes here, goes there. And, you know, Pico Iyer is the person who came up with this entire thing that, you know, in, in the liberalized global world, people lead lives in airports, so to speak, right? <laughs> but remember, <laughs> but here's the thing, and I often say this in my economic lectures, Pequire began there. And by the time globalized, we began to, and, you know, those were the days when Tom Friedman would tell us, look, the world is flat, mm-hmm. which is completely wrong. It's wrong in so many ways. I mean, I knew that even before I studied economics, that it's right. not possible. So Tom, Tom Friedman's theory was that, oh, look, if cultures begin to resemble each other in certain uh, choices that they make, and his choices were very at a sub, you know, you know, very sort of basic level. Everybody mm. wears blue jeans. Everybody has McDonald's. Sure. You know, there was this theory that Golden Arches theory that yeah. if two countries have McDonald's, then they don't go to war, which is absolutely wrong. I can't even believe that we actually believe this bullshit. I'm sure both Palestine and Israel have McDonald's. Just yeah, I, it is such bullshit. It's not yeah. even funny, right? I mean, it's just wrong. I don't know. Can we say bullshit? In yeah, your, yeah, of course, uh, of course. Okay, all right. I mean, uh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> That's really funny though, but anyway. <laughs> um, so that's totally wrong. And Pico Iyer, after going everywhere and traveling here, there, finally began to write about the art of stillness. Hmm. And he began to write about, there's this beautiful book he wrote where he goes with Leonard Cohen. Mm-hmm. And Leonard Cohen, again, who's been there, done that, uh, you know, yeah. uh, everything possible he has done, became a disciple to a Zen master. And spent time at the at a hut, you know, in the mountains serving the Zen master. And then Pico Iyer began to write about his family's association with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Right? And then he, you know, then this whole Japan thing happened. Pico Iyer's house in California burnt down. Mm. You know, his, his uh, um, and he was left homeless. So all roads led east. All roads led east, and now today Pico Iyer writes about the inner self. Oh, is he alive? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I, I had no idea. I had no idea. But but do you uh, think that's a consequence of like uh, people having an artistic career or spanning across the world, tireless, right? And then eventually realizing that yeah. it, it is it is more symbolic of older age as opposed to mm. like a thematic change in their life. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both, um, and especially in cultures like ours, since we're sitting in India, Mm. I think people discover at some point that once you go everywhere and do everything, right, that the change you're seeking is only possible as an internal journey and not an external journey. Now, this is nothing new. What I'm saying is no great wisdom from me. This has been said for thousands of years. You know, you go back to the... To the Vedanta literature, the Upanishads say exactly this. And Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. Hmm. Why be the change you want to see? Well, if you change from within, the world will change from outside, so to speak, right? Now, this wisdom has come back in vogue, so to speak, because today, more than ever before, when Gandhi said this, you know, Gandhi's handler wasn't tweeting 15 times every second saying... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, you know, lifting you know, light, Mahatma Gandhi, right. whatever, walking two steps. Today, we are in a world where everything has been so externalized. Mm. And let me explain what I mean by that. And I feel this too. I see my, you know, I don't have children, but, you know, I see my niece and so on and so forth. What was your sense of validation when you were young? Perhaps it came from your parents saying, oh, you did something nice. Your grandparents saying, beta, you did something, whatever. Hmm. Maximum, there would have been your school friends or whatever, your childhood friends, you know, whatever. You guys did something fun. Today, at a minute-to-minute basis, we have externalized our validation. Yeah. So, the food you eat must be validated by some unknown whatever, right? The places you go to, it's almost like people have... You know, I, I, I was telling my niece this time that... People have forgotten, your generation has forgotten to see things. Yeah. Because before you can actually see a beautiful place, you put a camera in front of you, right? Because you're seeking this validation. But that validation 
has a deep flip side because when you don't get that your anxiety will you know supersede anything else you've ever found that's why mental health cases are on the rise that's why there's so much you know turmoil in the world and you know internal turmoil in the world that's why this whole thing that the final answer is still within you and it's a journey yeah. that you want to traverse in fact funnily enough that we're talking about this i was just before coming here i was reading paul brunton you know i haven't heard of the gentleman so paul brunton was an english traveler since you're talking about traveling mm. and he came to india before independence he came to india when um you know at a very different time when we were still under british rule um and um he landed up going to the ashram of ramana maharishi hmm. uh you know the hill of arunachala right um and this is wonderful thing uh and he writes about this in the book in this it's called search for secret india i think and then paul brunton subsequently wrote a whole bunch of other books about meditation and this that and the other so paul brunton was an english traveler he had all these questions the world was in turmoil you know wars were all around conflict was all around quite like our world today and he was told that there is this sage who sits upon this hill why don't you go and he said so what does the sage do and he says he doesn't say anything and he was he, as an englishman he was like that makes no sense yeah and you want answers an englishman trying to find the meaning of life in india of course you want answers yeah of course and you want somebody to give you those answers yeah, right yeah. so he said okay fine i'm here i'll go right so he goes up and paul brunton writes that he had written or he had a whole series of questions to ask you know what's going to happen to the world you know will we survive war this that all kinds of things right so he enters the room where ramana maharishi is sitting and you know the the master used to sit on this whatever and just meditate he was largely silent he never said much and his eyes was closed and then paul brunton sits before him and uh, then you know he says i want to ask these questions then he rattles off all these questions iska kya hoga uska kya hoga whatever, whatever. so then ramana maharishi is silent and then he turns his head and opens his eyes and looks at paul brunton and paul brunton writes that in that moment when the master looked at him he felt all his questions disappear and there were no other questions left and you know see is even as i say it it's giving me good say this it's giving me goosebumps but he felt the questions melt away because after looking at him the master said to him you know ramana maharishi said to him who is the one who's asking these questions and paul brunton realized that he didn't know who was the person asking these questions fundamentally and the master said to him find out who is the person asking these questions and then you will find the answers and i think that is such an incredible story and it's such an eternal story uh, you know which transcends ages and it's so perfect for our time uh that you know it just speaks to me again and again you know i wrote about this reminds me if you don't mind um i wrote about shila prabhupad right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. singh nath so and pray yeah. shila prabhupad um had this thing where if people were trying to poke him you know because he was in america and he was an elderly man you know all these journalists would ask him some random questions when he didn't want to answer the question he would just say doesn't matter you just chant hari krishna and you know suddenly i remembered that you know this so what is he saying when he says just go and chant hari krishna he's saying you know you first do the inner work and then we will see yeah. what to do with your questions yeah it's funny how most masters across the world they you see their stories or hear their stories through the eyes of their disciples there's almost a common thread where the disciple is rejected at first because the inner work hasn't been done and throughout the journey once the inner work has been done at the end the person realizes they didn't need the master they needed the master to shine them right but i want to bring back an, another thread that you mentioned right the externalizing of things i've been noticing it so much i'm in this career mm-hmm. and um it's almost like your self esteem is also externalized right because you mentioned capturing space spaces and places and new things through your phones as opposed to through your eyes uh i made a deliberate rule to just let some things be for my eyes and memories and let them fade away 
right? That means deleting old photographs sometimes or letting go. Just because to get those out of me, you have to sit around the fire or meet me someday and then I have to sort of jog my memory and hopefully get back some of my dopamine receptors from all the over frying and tell you those stories. Um, but this, this whole idea of being internally content, how does it you know work out in a world like this where it's almost like you want to broadcast every moment and be like David Perel, the writer says, you're tuned into the ever present now at all times with all feeds. How do you then, even for your example, because you've written so many books and that requires a degree of aloneness, that requires a degree of your gray matter not being disrupted by a random tweet that comes in. How do you find that and then maintain that throughout while still engaging in this world? Because even while we deny, uh, you know, the, the, even while we say ki yaar, aaj hamare zamane ke andar ye sab hoti hai and there's nothing to do with it, uh, the world is only going to move to this direction. So the world will probably move in multiple directions. Yes, you're absolutely right that the world will largely move in this direction. But I think simultaneously, the world is also moving in a different direction, in the sense that more people than ever are seeking something that they cannot find. And are, you know, therefore this growth of, you know, in America, they call it SBNR. Mm -hmm. Spiritual right? but not religious. Spiritual but not religious. And here's this large volume, ever-growing volume of people who either call themselves SBNR or atheist or whatever, but they are constantly engaging to try and find the answers. Mm -hmm. Therefore, yoga is growing. Therefore, healthy living is growing. And you see, this is the thing, right? I mean, in, in our worldview, uh, detoxing doesn't begin just with you giving up certain kinds of food. Detoxing is a holistic detoxing. Right. You know, there was this uh, monk recently um, from uh, the Krishna Consciousness Movement, and he and I were having a conversation. And he said, you know, many years ago, there was a man who really was very keen, a young monk, very keen to understand Sri Chaitanya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's ideas. You know, the great uh, Bengal monk, you know, the Gaudiya Vaishnavite tradition, the man who really began singing and dancing on the streets of Bengal, right? And he went to one of these Oxbridge colleges where there was supposedly a scholar, right? And he said, oh, wow, this is amazing. This man must know so much. Let me go and ask him. So he went to this man's room and he was a professor. And that professor said, yes, yes, come, let's discuss Chaitanya. And he pulled out a cigar and he had some scotch and so on and so forth and poured it and you know began to smoke. And then he was giving all this sort of you know, fundas, as we would call it, about, you know, Chaitanya's philosophy. And that young monk realized at one point that this man only understood these things at an intellectual level. Mm. It, they, he knew all the right theories and the words and the research and so on and so forth. But there was a deep heartland of emotion in that whole universe of bhakti philosophy, you know, Chaitanya's bhakti philosophy, which he doesn't understand. And unless you understand that, you will only understand it at a particular level. You know, that's really one of my challenges, and I'll, I'll share this with you. When I wrote Being Hindu, um, you know, I have a dear friend who, uh, in fact, the book is dedicated to, uh, who's very spiritual minded, who told me that one of the biggest challenges that I will face as I do more and more of this kind of writing, is will it always remain at an intellectual level? Mm. And that has forever stayed with me for the last decade. And therefore, I have tried my level best, you know, to go down a very different path. Like there are many things, I mean, it's, it's funny, I've never discussed these things in podcasts or interviews before, but I have tried to in many ways eradicate a lot of things that would keep me only to the intellectual level of these things. Because that's very self-defeating. If I understand bhakti only uh, to, to be able to write a paper that will get published in some journal or a book that will you know people will read, then it's a great disservice. Forget it's a great disservice to the readers. It's mm -hmm. a great disservice to me. I can only do justice to myself and to people who read my work if I truly try to delve into the idea of Sharnagati. 
you know it's very easy to say sharnagati but especially for people who have arrogance about intellect being intellectual mm-hmm. i include myself in that giving up and truly understanding surrender to the divine is very very tough because you're used to thinking my mind is the most important thing right, right. i know what's going on and i will do this and i will solve that whereas in the spiritual process the first thing to understand is that you know this is an illusion of control right it's it's like kung fu panda right it's like you know did you, have you seen kung fu panda i have i have do you remember that scene where uh, you know master shifu uh, you know and 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 you know this um, says that you know you only have an illusion of control hmm. you can hit the tree and a fruit will fall but you have no control on you know you can just plant the seed but you have no control what tree it would be and what seed and when it will fall right yeah. we only have an illusion of control and there is a lovely clip of that online called the illusion of control right so we all have an illusion of control and i think if in order to do the work that i do if i keep it only at an intellectual level i'm doing great disservice like i have been to more temples and shrines for devotional purpose yeah after i starting to write this than i had ever done so before so you were yourself transformed into not just a scholar or an intellectual but yeah. also a someone who was open to the idea of faith and devotion as a practitioner yeah as a practitioner i chant i meditate i have tried to many ways to was there was there awkwardness it's like the the lapsed catholic comes home uh no because um maybe yes and no hmm. let me explain that um you know i came my parents are very devout you know especially my mother's side and so on and so forth so going to temples going to ram krishna mission vivekananda all of this was always part of our lives but the thing is one never engaged much with that because you see the entire point when one was growing up was that which job will you get hmm how much money will you make out of it which university will you go to that framework was so deeply embedded mm-hmm. all of this was not part of that framework but once i started writing about things like this i really felt very deeply from within that there's no point in me trying to do this intellectually alone that's a great disservice like today for instance you know i go to festivals and i mean i went to goa you know and mm-hmm. that was not even for a festival that was to meet my sister who now lives there and i found myself you know going to uh, a mahadev temple deep into the forests of south goa very deep there and i didn't even go to a beach to be honest <laughs> and nobody told me to do that i was on holiday but i just felt it and and i think if you are open to it this transformation is inevitable it is truly inevitable i know this from my own life this transformation is inevitable i have never when i go to a new city like this time also i went to bhubaneswar for a festival i always go to that ananta vasudeva temple and go and have bhog there and obviously the you know the organizers are constantly telling me you know let's go to this restaurant it's very good and this that and the other but i want to hmm. i genuinely feel something from within and i want to and i am trying to explain to you that this process is inevitable if one is open to it if you want to delve into this kind of matter you know um if one doesn't and does it at a very perfunctory level then the work will only go so deep it will not go further i have a little story then we can talk about yeah how even enabling you know your 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 worship has been enabled by also a structure that now allows you to be a public worshipper where yeah. where there is or there a whole ecosystem political yeah. and otherwise that sure. allows you to openly sure do it in in the safety and confines of not feeling judged as yeah. one would earlier yeah um so i obviously grew up in a religious family like most hindus do and um i i i was a very devout kid at yeah. that time and then of course at 13 14 you discover rock and roll and like yeah. everything else so this whole questioning a teenage questioning begins to happen um and then i came to faith much later on in my life but the whole temple worshiping thing really really happened once i started uh reading stories of demi gods and and the shan mm-hmm. gods in hinduism particularly kali shani mm-hmm. all of these gods i really found them fascinating mm-hmm. and then so when i read the stories i read so many stories 
not hurt them through through some loss in oral translation by a by a by a you know grandparent or a or a parent i ended up really enjoying the temple i en- i enjoyed mm-hmm. going and worshiping the deities seeing seeing the the way shani is uh, adorned with the mm-hmm. with the oil right the way he's sitting on his uh, on his uh, i don't know what what do you call garuda he's probably sitting on his garuda i'm not sure i i could mess this up right but it's it was so fascinating to, to finally have intellect meet faith mm. right and i think one of the reasons why most of people like me shunned or didn't look at faith the way they were supposed to is because we just saw faith in our parents generations we didn't see so much intellect attached to the faith mm. it was always like ye to aisa hai ye badhiya ho jayega surrender karo and i think that wasn't enough for us but now it's changed so what's also fascinating then is you are doing this at a time in in our country when hmm. the first thing you mentioned in the book is this book is about political hinduism not faith hinduism faith based hinduism that as most people know themselves as right so uh, it's called soul and sword the history of political hinduism it's out now has been out for a while why make that distinction hmm. because in this book it was very clear that i wanted to tell the story of what we call you know it was a project of intellectual history as it were this book is about political hinduism because if it was a book on hinduism it, that's a vast 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 canvas this was about let me make the distinction look all faith is fi- finally um, an inner change right now if you or i were to go sit in a distant cave or even in a you know whatever space and did whatever spiritual practices we did and didn't really engage with the world mm-hmm. that could still be called personal right but no faith is finally personal because faiths have to interact with the world right they have to interact with society when faiths interact with society then inevitably those faiths have a political engagement because at the end of the day society brings politics and the book soul and sword was to explain india's moment today mm. of a um, dominant political ideology of political hinduism uh, and its history and um, most people begin that story with uh, you know savarkar or maybe a little bit uh, uh, ahead of that chandranath basu and so on and so forth but you know as a bengali i realized because i'm also translating anandamat and and this happened completely by accident i was reading anandamat because i'm translating it line by line word by word for a new translation and i suddenly came upon the word hindutva and i realized that the first time the word hindutva had been used is in the same book by bankim chandra chattopadhyay mm-hmm. which gave us vande mataram mm. which then belies a whole wealth of analysis which says political hinduism was some fringe thing whereas the mainstream was something else and i was like no that's not true in fact political hinduism for most part especially before the arrival of the indian national congress and gandhi political hinduism was a dominant uh, you know ideology a dominant idea many of the people during the renaissance and afterwards who spoke about you know india's rejuvenation reawakening spoke in terms of uh spoke with an a sort of in um, hindu grammar a hindu uh, canvas so to speak right um uh, and they were not suggesting at all that others did not count in this canvas but they were saying that look at the end of the day nations have cultural essences mm-hmm. right america is a christian nation yes it is welcoming of everyone you can be whoever you want to be and live in america and have your shrine do your worship do whatever you want to do right mm. but at its very core when america says in god we trust which god are they talking about jesus christ of course right in england david cameron openly used to say in his easter messages we are a christian country we are welcoming of every faith beautiful mosques and temples and gurdwaras have been built in our country all of these communities rejoice in our country and have full freedom but at the very core our cultural essence is that we are a christian country all faiths similarly 
are welcome and we of course have a much greater history of diversity in our country but at our very core our foundational ideas come from the vedas and the upanishads mm-hmm. and they are by their very nature the word hindu comes much later but you know they are you know part of our sanatan framework our hindu framework that does not this is always misunderstood to say oh look this is this is going to keep away other people no it doesn't you know savarkar at the end of essentials of hindutva says that once you immerse yourself in this culture you stop even remaining part of hinduism what does he mean he means this ism part of it falls off hmm right you realize see ism is again a, a sort of western construct right. of of differentiation he says that actually once you delve deep into the because you see you know i often say in my lectures if you read the vedas and upanishads there is no other because the people who conceptualized and wrote the vedas and upanishads and thought of the vedas and upanishads did not see that oh this is indian and this is external and this is hindu and this is not hindu they were conceptualizing what makes life yeah what does it mean to live it was purely cosmic it, it, was, it was never purely, geographical right no not at all they were talking about ex- human existence in its totality hmm. right but at the end of the day it is different from other faiths and their foundational texts right and these are our found foundational texts and i would argue we are the most plural because our foundational texts not only do they not say hindu muslim sikh isai they are not even talking about geographies they are talking about the very heart of being human what does it mean to have life at all and forget life i mean they are of course talking about all living things mm-hmm. what does it mean to have life at all so the plurality is much greater that's how i see it now you could perhaps say well some people politicize this and there's conflict and so on and so forth sure but we live in you know we live in the world that we do mm-hmm. and anyway you know if you really think about it from an indian perspective this is this is the kali yuga right uh there are certain things that are inevitable in this yuga if it, as certain things were inevitable in you know earlier yugas so to speak in kali yuga there will be this you know this fractious uh divisions between people talking about divisions yeah. one of the chapters that sort of left me aghast was the vande mataram episode of yeah. a controversy the truncation of the vande mataram yes um and particularly the dialogue that took place between uh the makers mm-hmm. and and the and and the and the erstwhile congress party mm-hmm. uh who 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 thought that uh, some of the lines in the vande mataram would yeah. would lead to divide i would love for you to sort of explain what that what that controversy is and and you also mentioned that many people in the bjp still believe that what that was one of the reasons why you know the partition happened so these were like yeah vast claims i would love for you to maybe you know help me understand yeah so essentially see even with the truncated version of the vande mataram there there was still controversy about it okay. because it talks about worshiping bharat mata and so on and so forth. okay the vande mataram if you see the entire you know the entire all the verses talks about in much greater depth talks about the country as the mother and you know as the goddess and the goddess who should be in worship and the goddess who've been you know destroyed and um, you know f- defiled and so on and so forth and you know how uh, its children must fight back and s- but there is a context to this and i want to explain this context to you bankim chandra chattopadhyay who wrote vande mataram and wrote ananda mat the book from where it comes from mm-hmm. bank you have to understand what was his universe Bunkim's universe or Bunkim's universe was a sort of late Nawab period in Bengal. Remember Shirajuddaulah it is true Shirajuddaulah fought the British and was betrayed by Mir Jafar and Battle of Plassey all of this is true. But Shirajuddaulah and many of his people were also very cruel. There are historical accounts of the kind of you know ravages that uh happened under shiraj ud-daula including with women including taking away lands all kinds of things you know there is an analysis that the house of jagat seth the most powerful bankers perhaps india has ever seen and one of the most powerful ever in the world 
One of the reasons Shirajud Dola was defeated was that the house of Jagat Seth did not support Shirajud Dola. And one of the reasons some people argue that the house of Jagat Seth never supported Shirajud Dola was because of these excesses, so to speak, of the cruelties. And if you think Shirajud Dola committed cruelties and there's evidence of that, what happened after his defeat was much worse. Bengal was governed by a series of quote-unquote minor nawabs, all deeply hand-in-glove with the East India Company. Mm. And their excesses upon the people, you know, that's why Bengal began to have these huge famines. Think about it. Bengal is a place where even my grandmother used to say, Ki wo, and I'm going to say this in um, Hindi so that more people understand, Ki wo chawal ka dana bhi fake ne se na, it becomes a full field. Right, right. It was so fertile. Right? It's is it still the most, fertile today? Uh, yes, it is still yeah. fertile. I mean, of course, now there's been lots of excesses, pesticides, all kinds of things. But it's nowhere compared to what has happened in the Punjab. Okay. Bengal is still very fertile. So, some of the most fertile lands, right? That entire place was extracted, exploited and oppressed in such a manner mm -hmm. that had some of the most cruel famines. Bonkim saw all that. That was his universe. So therefore, Anand Mutt was about these bands of sadhus, you know, ascetics, who came out of the forest and fought the oppressive rule of the Nawab and the, their cohorts of the East India Company. That's why at the end of Anand Mutt, one of the sadhus actually says that maybe Queen, you know, the English Queen's rule would be better than this. Hmm. Because the oppression we are facing now at least if it was directly the British government, there would be some recourse. Because these people are completely barbarians, what they're doing to us. Right? So that was the, that was the universe. And so, of course, there was a complaint against this, even in the song. But of course, you know, as you would read in the book, there were people who objected, saying this is anti-Muslim and this, that and the other, without understanding that this was the context in which this was written. It was... Uh, uh a, a war cry against the Nawabs who were inflicting pain on them as Absolutely. opposed to the faith, right? Absolutely. It was a war cry against the Nawabs and the East India Company who were inflicting f uh, terrible cruelties on the people, sometimes even in the name of faith. But don't you think that if if the lines would have been, if the entire Vande Mataram yeah. was published as is, yeah. with loss in translation taking in place yeah. and history being forgotten, yeah. that this... Uh, you know, attack on the Nawabs would yeah. be considered an attack of Muslims and they yeah. would actually be wrongly criticized and persecuted. This is a good question, but you must consider that already, already there were a, a whole bunch of things that had happened during that time, hmm. right? There was already Gandhi who was giving a very different message. There was already Jinnah who had its own ideas. There was Iqbal who had a very clear and defined idea mm -hmm. that how the country should be divided. Therefore, when this additional question came up, the point was that already there is talk of division. Already there are riots everywhere. Mm. So at, at what point do you stop saying we will not do this because it will make a bunch so of... So Vande Matram was conceptualized right before the no, partition? No, Vande Matram was, happened much before. Okay. And the song had been sung for a long time. In, in, in its entirety? In its entirety in Bengal and many other places. It uh -huh. had been sung many, many times. When it came to the context of the song becoming, uh, you know, popular around, listen, I mean, uh, you know, the long before Gandhi came to the scene, there were revolutionaries in Bengal singing Vande Mataram to the gallows, mm. right? There were young men and women who were singing Vande Mataram and sacrificing their life. So there had to be a line which is drawn in that time in many people's minds on how much would be enough to keep this peace because the peace was anyway being divided right the peace was anyway you know getting disturbed every day remember for a long period of time before independence india was a place where riots were common there were lots and lots of riots, especially in northern india there were endless rioting in pockets con constantly right 
in northern India, in eastern India, in you know, western India, there were lots and lots of this Hindu-Muslim collision. Now when this part also came up, and you know, we know what Gandhi said after the Mopla riots famously. What did he say? After the Mopla riots, Gandhi advised that um, essentially, even though uh, the Hindus had been butchered, the best thing they could do was forget it. And, uh, and it's all in the book. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. um, the Gandhi advised that it would be um, in order to keep the peace between communities, um, Hindus essentially had no right to strike back. Um, even if they were, you know, raped and butchered and so on and so forth, Gandhi said that in order for the greater common good to, you know, be maintained, um, Hindus should still embrace their uh, killers and rapists and uh, murderers. Now, you know, if you let's let's give the most generous explanation to this, you could say Gandhi did not believe in violence of any kind sure and therefore he would suggest no such action so to speak right and yet it was the same gandhi who was raising entire uh, hordes of people to go fight for the british it was the same gandhi who was bringing um, furious and fervent activism on the streets of india for something that was happening in Turkey. What? Yes. It was the same Gandhi, please, the Khilafat movement, which right, split. It was the same Gandhi who was saying Muslims had a, a right to protest against, uh, you know, the destruction of the Ottoman Empire and the Caliph had to be protected because the Caliph oversees the holiest shrines of Islam. So the dichotomous messages that came out Mm -hmm. upset a lot of people and a lot of people then began to say i'll give you one example okay i'm a biographer of sadar patel you know the man who saved india there is an incident in that book where right before independence already india has faced one wave of attack it knows what's going on from pakistan under jinnah the treasuries of the two countries are being divided India has to pay Pakistan 55 crores. Okay. Sardar Patel says, we have already seen the troubles in Kashmir. They have already started. Let us withhold this money until India and Pakistan sit down on the table, thrash out their borders one for, once and for all, and end all strife, confusion and violence. Money will be paid. Hmm. Let's not leave this open. If you leave this open, there will be trouble in the future. What happens to after that? Nehru protests. Maulana Azad protests. Sadar Patel still tries to stand firm. Then Gandhi says, if this happens, I will go on a fast, pay the money right away. The money is paid without any discussion happening. What is the price India has paid? We must ask what is the price India paid for this decision? If Sardar Patel would have brought the two sides onto the table withholding the money and thrashed out the Kashmir problem with a clear border once and for all at that moment, what would have been our 75 years of history compared to what it, what it has been? Sure. I have a question in the most earnest way possible, sure. right? And I, I wanted to ask this of someone who's as educated and as interested in all of these topics as you are. Sure. When I look at all the literature right around yeah. me right now, right, yeah. there is a there is a massive resurgence of, yes. of political Hindu literature, Hinduism sure. literature, sure. right? And in all of those cases, for some reason, uh, you know, Nehru is burned at the stake, mm. right? Um, it's almost like mm. for the integral human humanism of the rss or the new right to emerge mm-hmm. nehru as we put on this stage. Sure. i always see it nehru in secularism is, is shat on mm-hmm. in, in numerous books <laughs> numerous speeches numerous talks mm-hmm. and you know one of my wiser friends once told me when 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 governments change the first thing that changes the history mm-hmm. right so i do see a rewriting of history happening mm-hmm. all across the country you know there is no two ways about it mm-hmm. but then i then i'm you know i always i always wondered 
is there nothing redeeming about nehru or gandhi mm. or is it that enough time has passed mm. and because they've been in the limelight for so long mm. even the skeletons are coming out of the closet like realistically yeah were were they absolutely against the idea of of a country that has majoritarian hinduism mm. at mm. the core mm. or were they just they didn't did they not know any better can we not mm. give them any benefit of doubt no i am not one of those people who says that gandhi and nehru has to be wiped out not mm. at all in fact a lot of people are angry when i say that india will always need gandhi for all his mistakes and errors india will always need gandhi because gandhi's flaws we can keep counting gandhi's flaws and i can myself tell you numerous gandhi's flaws right okay but gandhi still represents an ideal if not in deed in words hmm. you know i always say to many of my audiences and this is you know famous in many spiritual uh, practices don't go by what the guru does go by what the guru says it's the reverse it's very sort of you know people would say no 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 but it's actually the reverse no because the guru is still a human being the wisdom is in the teaching you don't have to ape what the guru does in life you have to take the core message of what the guru's ideals and teachings are it's the same way with gandhi yes mm. gandhi is ill treated his wife yes gandhi was estranged from his children Yes Gandhi a litany of you know problems we can say about Gandhi and yet we cannot deny that in that traumatic phase of world history mm. Gandhi represents an ideal and in a country as fractious as us as diverse as us that ideal is always to be respected can we also not say that when when they were othering hindus they they probably figured that we have to preserve the diversity of the country and the muslims yeah. are disenfranchised yeah. so we must make sure that their interests are protected above the interests of others yeah. or did they not have a book a rule book to get stuff out of because i'm also saying this also at a time when you yourself mentioned that the yeah. the, the india that narendra modi helms is 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 leading is a very prosperous country as opposed yeah. to the the india that nehru inherited correct so to to think of religious identity or a political identity uh, political religious identity at the center of yeah. it can we not say that maybe that was not the objective at the time look there is no doubt that seeing what they had seen the kind of bloodshed they had seen in the partition there was an instinct to avoid that bloodshed happening again right there's no doubt about that I am also not one of those people who says that there is nothing rede- redeeming about Nehru. Nehru brought a certain westernized sensibility which allowed him to in policy making distance himself from the fractious divisionism of India. Mm. Right? It's almost as if you know it's like the English language because it's English makes you stand apart from the otherwise you know bengali would say we are better we got the first nobel and tamil would say we are the oldest right, language right. and then somebody else would say something else right i'm giving a very sort of simplistic explanation but i'm sure you understand what i mean what i mean i do so nehru's elitism and i see this in my book on sardar patel nehru's elitism was instrumentalized by nehru to give himself that distance for policy making where he thought things were becoming very fractious hmm this is not to say that nehru wasn't particularly naive for instance on questions on china on questions on extreme left ideology all of this is true and they are documented right i also don't claim that nehru only had a fractious relationship with patel for instance look these were people who had in a sense given up their lives and their families and had been part of this movement for a long long time right for all practical purposes they were the only families that they had themselves you know gandhi was far closer in a sense to people like nehru and patel than to his own children yeah it's like you you eat at work and you sleep at work and that was work for them Patel was closer to Gandhi and Nehru than his own daughter and own uh, children and uh, his own parents would gone long ago and his mm. own wife 
So he, all these people were far closer to one another than we today assume. Having said that, look, we are a country which thought in a particular way for a long time. Lots of things were buried, mm. right? I'll give you one example. Nehru you know, set an extremely wrong precedence by accepting, let's give the most generous description of this, accepting the Bharat Ratna as the first sitting prime minister. Now, there are some people today who come and say, no, no, the president gave it to him. He was not a child of two years, right? The lollipop was given to him and he put it in his mouth and walked away. What do you mean gave it to him? The prime minister, especially the first prime minister, had more executive power than anybody else. Right. So he set a bad precedence and subsequently many others of his family did the same thing. Right. That's a bad example to set. He set the wrong precedence by pushing and not giving the Bharat Ratna to his closest political rivals like Patel, like Ambedkar, who had to wait till the 90s to get the Bharat Ratna. Mm. Right. What I mean, I'm going to sound very ignorant, but I've I've been seeing that a lot of Bharat Ratnas have been recently given out. Yeah. What, is it a symbolic gesture? What is the coetist? What, what, what exactly is this award? So look, the Bharat Ratna is given to the highest achievement that a Indian can do, right? Now that you will say, what does an achievement mean then, mm. right? An achievement could be something like a great writer of great repute, okay. a great filmmaker, a great somebody who has transcends boundaries of usual definitions of acclaim, Got it. right? Got it. So, aren't the Padma Bhushan, Padma Vibhushans also similar in this category? Bharat Ratna is the highest. Okay. We okay. begin at Bhar Padma Shri and go up to the Bharat Ratna. And then there are many, I think we have started a very good thing of giving uh, these awards, the Padma Awards, to the to people who have done great service at the grassroots. Hmm. You see the kind of Padma winners we have. As opposed to people who you meet in lawn parties in, in exactly. India. Exactly. Exactly. Because these are people who have worked for years in the grassroots. And you see them. Often they are from very poor background. Mm -hmm. So today I think the awards are far more inclusive. You know, there was a phase when the awards were very, you know, uh, colloquial in that sense. Ki, okay, chalo you know, my friend, somebody's recommendation, this, that, all kinds of things, right? And very, often very Delhi-centric, hmm. right? Delhi plus, you know, this... You had to stay on Akbar Road to get an award. <laughs> <laughs> no, and a very sort of Darbaresque feel to it. Hmm. That, ye mein ecosystem mein hoon, aur ye mere godfathers hai, to mujhe mil gaya. Hmm. Right? Today, when you see the videos of all these people winning, you can see that these people are from... This really some of the most humble places yeah. in India. Some of them are absolutely like they've just come from the brink of poverty to literally, receive that award. Yeah. Literally. And yet, if you look at their contribution, you feel ashamed that wow, you're so privileged and what have you done? Mm. Whereas they have nothing and what have they done? Right? It's right. incredible. So look, I don't think, you know, I, I'm not an absolutist. However, I think because a lot of things were whitewashed, mm -hmm. a lot of things are coming out now we will at, at some point find a balance. And there is a fundamental error. In India, everybody has been taught that, oh, history has been, has been rewritten as if it's a great sin. No. If, you, if anybody knows anything about history writing, the point of history writing is every generation has the right to re-look at events and figures constantly afresh in the light of new evidence. Mm. This is what happens in England. This is what happens in America. This is what happens in every other part of the world. You think of how many times Winston Churchill has been written about right. from various angles. There must be hundreds of books on Winston Churchill. And yeah. not just Churchill, on every you know, major minor figure. Whereas we think in canonical terms. Ki ji, iske baare mein isne lik diya. Ye final word hai. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, yeah. Bipin Chandra ne hamare society ke baare mein likha tha. Generations wohi parte aare hain. Wohi final word hai. Aur jo isko question karega, that person must have an agenda. Hmm. No. Bipin Chandra had a particular idea of Indian society, which is, particular, which is perfectly fine. There could be others, as the years go by, who will re-look at what he has written from new angles, using new tools, new assessments, and rewrite that story. 
It's not that, oh, what is the final word? We think of final words. When I wrote my Patel book, do you know, for 30 years, nobody had ever written on Patel. Really? Yes. And I was like, that's ridiculous. These sort of figures are re-looked at every few years in most parts of the world. But we always think of canonical terms. That, oh, this is the book and yehi satya hai. Yeah. But which is really ridiculous. I mean, especially yeah. in our culture where we have been, uh, we are constantly encouraged to find new ways of looking at the yeah, truth. I think we, we use the school tuition stem approach to history exactly it's like yeah, rs agarwal of maths etc whatever right i think we we sadly use that yes and that has led to much peril yes um you also mentioned in your book about how sardar patel although being a staunch congressman all yes. his life and yet having ideological dissimilarities with some of the same people in the congress was actually celebrated by the bjp very recently and yeah. you know we have his statue and whatnot um i found that fascinating you, his, since you've written a book on him, his contributions are not known as well in the country. We yeah. are only now retrospectively seeing him for the man he was. Um, how how important was he a figure in, in as far as political Hinduism is concerned? Since we're on that, so let's begin with how important a figure was he in in totality. Okay, all of us grew up understanding the Indian map in a particular way. Yes, that map would have not existed without without him, with him. single handedly. That is the one line that you need to remember about Patel. The very map, the cartographic imagination of India, of modern India, is not possible without 500 Patel. 500 princely states into 28 at that time. And the British India coming together. Hmm. Hyderabad may have broken off. Jinnah was trying to take Raj part of Rajputana. All kinds of things. All kinds of things were happening. Kashmir, we don't know what would have happened. Hmm. All kinds of shenanigans were happening. You know, Junagar, the Nawab of Junagar was trying to act funny. Patel famously said, if I, again, once again, when everybody was dithering on what to do on Hyderabad, Patel said, if I don't do this now, generations afterwards will abuse me, saying he was in charge of internal security. He left a cancer in the stomach of India. Mm. So without Patel, we don't have the India that we, you and I know. Yeah. That's the bottom line. He was the man who, even though he was extremely unwell, uh, he pushed through this. Now, his because he died early, other people didn't want to give him credit. That's a whole other story, right? Also, remember, the Congress used to be a what we call a big tent party. Mm -hmm. All kinds of people were part of the Congress. The extreme left were also part of the Congress. The extreme right were also part of the Congress. Everybody was part of the Congress. Patel definitely veered towards a far more, you know, we haven't done enough research, I often feel, on Indian pragmatism. You know, pragmatism is a very well-defined political ideology. Is it not the same as conservatism? Is it different? No, not at all. No. So pragmatism is... There is some yeah. overlap, but pragmatists do things based on the reality that they see today. And I mm. say in my Patel book, for instance, how should we look at Gandhi, Nehru and Patel? Gandhi was a moralist. Hmm. Everything had a spiritual hue to it. Right? Nehru was a romantic. He had a vision of what the world should look like. This is how India should look like. This is how the world should look like. The only person who was dealing with the crisis at that moment was Patel. Because yeah. that's what pragmatists do. They deal with the world that they see in front of them. There might be a world that is better, which is possible tomorrow. Yeah. But they deal with the world that is in front of them. There's a great story about this. Let me tell you. Patel was also the, uh, you know, the treasurer of the Congress party. <coughs> and, you know, all these great movements Gandhiji did, you know, uh, required a lot of money. You know, uh, famously, to keep Gandhiji in poverty required a lot of money. <laughs> right? <laughs> so... This is a famous statement, right? I mean, to give Gandhi in poverty took a lot of money. So, where would the money come from? Patel had the widest network of Indian entrepreneurs, Indian capitalists, big business, whatever you want to call it, who would fund. Mm. Uh, G.D. Birla famously said that his relationship with Patel was chits of would come on or to him, which had a figure in Patel's handwriting written on it. Mm. And he would hand over that money. Right? And that's why G.D. Birla and Patel of and course. Gandhi were very close and so on and so forth. Right? So somebody once went up to Patel and said, you know, you deal with all these business people and money and all of that. 
Gandhi ji is not happy about this, you know, because this is not dealing with all these capitalists and so. So Patel said, Gandhi is Mahatma. I am not Mahatma. Mm. I have to run the party. And the party running this party, running this movement requires funds. After independence, Patel was told, Pandit Nehru doesn't like all this handling with capitalists and all of that. You know, we should go towards a socialist future. Patel said, all of these people supported us in running the party when we had nothing and we were fighting the empire. I am not going to desert these people, you know, just because we have now received independence. They are going to be part of the nation building process. I am not going to make them villains. Two philosophers, one CEO. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> So, you know, so there is a, there is always complex history behind these things, right? So he was a deep pragmatist. Mm. Um, and I actually think that a, may a million voices thrive. May many other people write books, you know, may they look at it from all kinds of angles. What's the harm? But we had created an India where certain books or certain people couldn't be written about in a particular mm. way, right? You tell me... <coughs> Why did we not have a real, uh, you know, detailed book on political Hinduism? Even if you wrote about political Hinduism, you had to abuse it. Really? That's the only kind of book that so you're talking about. Which year when, when you... No, no. So I'll tell you, in 2013, when I finished writing Being Hindu, mm. I had already written four or five books before that. Mm. And this is when, when the Narendra Modi phenomenon, as we know, was nowhere around. No, was... no, not at all. There was no Narendra Modi phenomenon at that time. My agent in America pitched it to a whole bunch of publishers in India. Mm. All of them said no. Two of them said, why don't you change the word being Hindu to being Indian? Because being Hindu might be sectarian. Mm. To which my agent pointed out lots of other books which had been written on Islam, Christianity, this, that and the other in India. But they still refused to publish. The publisher used to publish with, at that time, not Penguin. Penguin came later with being Hindu. At that time, refused to publish it. Saying, no, 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 this uh, will seem controversial. We cannot publish it. Until, and here's the funny thing. Until, in one literature festival, my agent happened to come from America, bumped into Shobha Day. Mm -hmm. And they got talking and my agent told Shobha Day, you know, there's this young author who's writing all these books and he's written a very lovely book on you know, the experience of being Hindu from a, you know, an ordinary practitioner's point of view. And all these publishers are saying this. Shobha Day being Shobha Day from her generation and being genuinely, a, a, you know, like, a, you know, somebody who thinks uh, independently said, what rubbish? How can people stop other people from doing work? I have an imprint with Penguin. I will publish it under my imprint. You send the manuscript to me. The moment word got around that Shobha Day wanted to publish this book, immediately I found a publisher. Do you know I had found a publisher for being Hindu in America before I could get one from India? That's crazy. That was the India we lived in. See, you have to see all of these things in a historical context. That is what India had become. So today what you're seeing, if you feel lots of things are being written from one direction, it is a balancing act of what has happened for 70 years. Mm. Right? And, I, and therefore I feel that when enough of both sides start coming out, a natural equilibrium balance would come. I am not somebody who ever says, let a million other books praising uh, Pandit Nehru come out. Right? I have no problems. I am never going to suggest that somebody cannot write this, cannot write that. But we had created a framework where certain things could only be touched if a bitter critique was launched. And your, and your friendships and your, you know, the way you speak, you're very eloquent, very well researched. And maybe your friendships in the publishing world or literary festivals, that, that in-group didn't help you at no, all? No, not at all. Because, number one, I, am, I consider myself an outsider. And I was certainly a more of an outsider that time, hmm. right? 10 years ago. Look, there is a, I mean, Delhi operates in cliques, okay? And these cliques are very well organized, very tightly knit, you know? Um, 
you know, it's, it's that, it's that um, famous statement, right? The Khan market consensus. You couldn't deviate from the Khan market consensus. There was a consensus about how India needed to be portrayed. Mm. If you portrayed anything apart from that, there was a problem. Why did I write my book on Swami Vivekananda? Because one day, I was, I still remember this so distinctly. One day I began to watch this video where this strange professor had been platformed by a man who was later uh, arrested for trying to rape a girl in Goa. That strange man and, you know, who, uh, you know, I think is still fighting a case or God knows what is happening with him. He used to do this festival and he had platformed the strange professor or academic, I don't know what he was, who proceeded to say that Swami Vivekananda maligned the teachings of Ramakrishna Paramans. I was like, what are you talking about? And that Swami Vivekananda was this, whatever, this uh, militaristic nationalist and I don't know what they said. Mm. And I came from a Ramakrishna Mission background. I had grown up seeing all these people. I mean, it is the most non-political organization that you can think of. Mm. And I was like, if at all, I still didn't feel that he shouldn't write what he should write. He wrote. It's fine. He wrote something, whatever. But surely there should be an argument from the other side also. Right. That argument was entirely missing. I think over 10 years, we've now had an argument. A lot more could be done. I think let every voice thrive. Let people write whatever they want to write, as long as the mm -hmm. quality is good. Right. And at the end of the day, this is the debate through which nation building happens. But we cannot quieten one side completely. And that never works. There will always be a repercussion at some point in history. So I think we are going through, you know, I often like to say that, you know, in our tradition, there's a Samudra Manthan, right? I mean, you would have heard of this. Of the, course, love the Samudra Manthan. The devas and the asuras, you know, sort of yeah. churn, by the way. There was but a way, across the mountain. Yeah. Correct. But, but remember, the asuras, you know, contrary to what the West tells us, they are not devils or villains or anything yeah, like i have that. a i'm gonna interview this gentleman very soon Anand Nil -Nil -Nilakantan. He's oh yeah he's a good friend way. of mine yeah. yes yes okay. so not at all i mean they are just they are, this is a different perspectives of human life mm -hmm. so in that churn what happens is finally what are they trying to get at they're trying to get at the nectar of life right but before the nectar a lot of you know poison comes out remember yeah. shiva is neel kant because and remember you said neel kant and yeah. neel kant because that poison would destroy the universe. So Shiva has to hold it in his neck. Right. Even he cannot drink it. Mm -hmm. Eternally he has to hold it in his neck, right? So obviously, poison is obviously a dramatic way of putting it. But a lot of stuff will come out. We are going through a period of great churn. Lots of stuff will come out in, in our history, right? And, uh, you know, this debate is very welcome. And I, you know, I think it, we would only gain from it. One of the things you mentioned in the book is... You have a whole history of political Hinduism emerging. Yes. You've got the Anand Mutt. You've obviously got Savarkar and many others. Right? Yes, yes. But then when political Hinduism actually begins to have a significant impact yes. politically, not just yes. as a, a thing you exchange in memos and sure. letters and private conversations that the public is not privy to, is when Vajpayee mm. and LK Adwani come to the national fold yeah. and uh, gain prominence yeah. and... Uh, I found that part very interesting and yeah. I would love for you to sort of comment more on one, their background, second, their friendship and how the orator from Hinterland India India, and, and the, the missionary school student, the missionary school student, the urban missionary school student, band together to yeah. help Vajpayee navigate yeah. Lutian's Delhi. Yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story, right? I mean, actually, uh, Vajpayee was more sort of uh, socially more open. Advani is fairly, you know, patrician and, you know, he maintains a certain decorum in, in mm -hmm. Vajpayee is the sort of, you know, enjoyed a drink, you know, uh, ate too many sweets, you know, was diabetic. And um, uh, Advani ji, I heard, I've heard that um, he's, I mean, he's always been very Spartan, but one of the reasons for his relative good health is that he's always been a very sparse eater. Mm. Oh, whereas Mr. Vajpayee always, you know, enjoyed his food and so on and so forth. So I think it's a really unique uh, 
uh, story. I once um, uh, told Advani ji that uh, a book should be written about uh, both of them and their story, uh, which because it's a unique story, and um, you know I think some uh, books have come out on that subject. Uh, I think um, these two people from very very different backgrounds molded a idea into a modern political movement. I also mention in my book that the mysterious deaths of Shama Prasad Mukherjee and then Deen Dayal Upadhyay really cast a shadow on this movement because these were the two tallest leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, after all, Mukherjee was one person who could effectively challenge even Nehru on many subjects, right? Deen Dayal Upadhyay was an intellectual, right? The revival of this movement happens with people like Vajpayee and Advani at its helm because they are able to take the ideas that were close to their heart and make it truly mass. Mm -hmm. But the real massification of that also, remember, only begins to a degree with the JP movement against Indira Gandhi. Jansen becomes part of the government, right? Um, but... After the breakaway of the Jansang and, you know, the, this dual membership idea, can one be part of the broader sort of uh, structure uh, running the government and be part of the RSS? This is dual membership. Whereas all the RSS members clearly say at that point that, no, we cannot give up our RSS membership because it's truly like family to us. Right. They then go on to create the Bharatiya Janata Party, right? Uh, and the Bharatiya Janata Party then, um, you know, creates... The, an entire public movement to spread their ideology and the final push to make it mass happens with the Ratyatra, right? So the JP movement gives them a first flip towards power, hmm. but then it sours very quickly. Mrs. Gandhi comes back to power. This dual membership thing happens. All kinds of you know problems crop up. Then a new party is created. And then the final big push that was required comes with the Ayodhya movement. It's fun, uh, funny today to remember that the Ayodhya movement began, you know, the Rath Yatra began from the same Somnath that Sadar Patel had left word uh, with K.M. Munshi that had to be rebuilt. And Pandit Nehru tried hard to stop the rebuilding. He said it will be Hindu revivalism, right? Correct. That's what he said in the book. Correct. And uh, even uh, suggested to the first president, Rajendra Prasad ji, that he should not go to the inauguration of Somnath Temple. Uh, mm -hmm. The president didn't listen to him, lined up going there. But, um, you know, Advani ji writes in his book, uh, My Country, My Life, that, uh, you know, when he went to Somnath and the, you know, Rath Yatra began from there, he understood that, the, you know, this was the whole significance of all of these things coming together. So how was... So at this point, um, you know, they have a new party and yeah. Advani and Vajpayee are sort of building the first real political movement yes. around espousing Hinduism into the national fold, into making it, like you said, Masi, and to allowing this latent culture to be also affected by policy, right? Yeah. What on on this on the his, historical end? You've got all of these predecessors that they're coming from. All of this history. Yeah. How do they enact this? Like, how does political Hinduism, or how does Hinduism then enact it politically? In what acts? You mm -hmm. said Yatra is one, right? The Ayodhya uh, movement. And what is this doing to say the citizens of the country? Is there any pushback against this? Mm -hmm. And and how is this identity being consolidated? Because we also have to remember this is predating the era of social media. Yeah. So we have too many articles, too many essays now to document everything that is happening right now in the Modi government, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the successor of the political Hinduism movement. No, absolutely. And there is a lot of pushback, um, uh, not from, uh, you know, obviously the Rath Yatra is very successful, but remember, Advani ji is arrested by Lalu ji in, in Bihar. Why is that? Uh, Advani ji is arrested by no, Lalu. Wh why is that? Uh, because Lalu Prasad Yadav feels that this is not secular mm. and this will, you know, destroy the country. Right. So is I have a question. So so because Yadavs and Muslims typically have vote banks in in you know Eastern UP and Bihar, because they have to appeal to those vote banks, is that why they push back against it? Yeah, and that that is that is the reason uh, you will hear from say uh, the you know so sort of a 
you know, pro BJP analysis would talk about this, and there is some truth to that. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the pro Lalu Yadav analysis would say that no, 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 he genuinely believed that this is not good for secularism and so on and so forth, right? Um, you know, many people say that one of the reasons why uh, Mrs. Gandhi, Mrs. Sonia Gandhi, actually, you know, has always been very, um, you know, uh, he has always been very fond of Lalu Prasad Yadav is because of this one act that he stood up for a particular kind of secularism mm -hmm. uh, when it was most needed. Uh, but this, I mean, we don't know the truth about that. Right. This is just something that people say. But it's certainly true that uh, Lalu Prasad Yadav had deep uh, friendships within the, at the highest echelons of the Congress party and proceeded to maintain that over many, many years. Uh, from the BJP point of view, of course, uh, Advani's arrest stalls the Yatra, but something had been triggered in society. Mm. And remember, there is also a moment where, uh, this is also a moment where Ramayana and Mahabharat, which Advani ji had suggested for a long time should be uh, shown on Indian television, begins to be shown. Mm. And it's an incredible reception. You know, no one can think of the kind of reception it got. You know, cities shut down for the broadcast of Ramayana and Mahabharat. Um, people sit with puja ki thali in front of the television sets for Ramayana and Mahabharat. Um, I remember seeing just last year, you know, Arun Govil who played Rod Ram, Prabhu Shri Ram, just last year was emerging out of a, um, an airport and there's this lady who sees him and begins to weep and bear, bows down and he's obviously very uncomfortable and he's like, don't do this. But I, but you can see that he's, I mean, he knows that this is, you know, this is Astha. Yeah. And she touches his feet. Now, one part of us may say, oh, look, I mean, you know, this is how these things get, you know, uh, stoked in a country and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. But remember, um, I don't believe that that lady doesn't understand that this is not Prabhu Shri Ram. What she's respecting is the fact that when she saw the show for the first time, it brought alive in her mind a sense of devotion that she may as an individual may have carried forever. Mm. It gave life to that devotion. And she's paying respect to that. I don't believe the people who say, oh, you know, look, an illiterate woman doesn't know anything. That's rubbish. Everybody knows everything these days. Mm. And not today in the age of social media, you know. I think the lady also knows that this is not God. But she's giving respect and honor as much as she can to the person who enacted in such a beautiful way uh, a character who, through, uh, to, which, to whom she feels so much devotion. And she's paying respect to that idea, to her mind and imagination being able to see almost, um, you know, the uh, Prabhu Shri Ram in life. Yeah, I wonder... In I don't know his story, but he may just have been, hey, this role will make me some money and make me happy. And then, but yeah. this whole journey might have completely purified him and cleansed him. But you know, that's true. If you look at what Arun Govil did after the Ramayan, okay. he never veered very deep into other kind of stuff. He remained in this whole spiritual, quasi-spiritual, slightly devotional universe. Hmm. He never veered very dramatically. I mean, you will not find, okay, he did the Ramayan and suddenly after that he played some villain in some hmm. whatever. He didn't. But that's also a, like a, a smart market decision. Maybe, maybe. But I think we should also, coming from India and knowing what we know of our history, we should also at least give keep some space for the fact that people may have genuinely felt something in the long process that they lived with this character. Mm -hmm. Because remember, even um, uh, many of the, the uh, actor who played Sri Krishna never went and did some dramatic other things after that. Mm -hmm. He also, uh, I mean, his popularity, of course, I think he fought an election and won uh, locally once. But he also remained broadly in that and then sort of faded away. Like he didn't do anything dramatically I, I, different. I'm just hypothetically assuming. I don't no, think no. you can because, you know, I think the stakes maybe. are the stakes get too high. Where, maybe, maybe. Where your deification should not be replaced by some 
two bit animosity like, yeah, yeah two bit like where you're like i don't know slapping someone three times and then yeah. like us like that whole serial masala is happening so maybe yeah. maybe you avoid that i want no it's s- possible yeah. i mean i'm not denying what you're saying yeah. i'm just saying we should take a holistic approach to looking at these things mm-hmm. because neither neither of us know what the truth is right mm-hmm. but it is true that many people feel this kind of devotional very devotion very powerfully in our country mm-hmm. and i would say if look we are taught in uh, we are, we were always taught that lived experience counts right so my question is why does this lived experience not count if every lived experience counts then people who feel this kind of you know piety and devotion their lived experience also counts when you when you were trying to get being hindu published did the idea of being a political hindu or just hindu did it fascinate you from an intellectual standpoint it still does and i i, I don't think i'm anywhere close to you know over no but like even as a kid growing up right like because uh, we are a few generations two two generations apart i think um even then were other people sort of talking about it was this like in the national conversation the way it is now and did yeah. you feel some support for this like basically what i'm asking is were yeah. you pursuing this idea in a silo all by yourself or did you have an ecosystem to sort of help no. you with this no no i didn't know i mean i was a journalist i i didn't have like now i know many more people i knew journalistically i knew a lot of people i used to be a journalist you know i was a business journalist so i knew a lot of business people at that mm-hmm. time uh i didn't have any sort of and there wasn't such an ecosystem you know uh all of this has happened later uh so in a sense that was quite a silo solo uh activity it's once uh, what happened was once the book got published then i think there was a lot of suddenly i realized that you know a lot of people had a lot of very interesting things to say about this and so on and so forth um and uh, and yeah and it has never stopped after that so uh, it's it's been very very interesting look i think um i am certainly not anywhere close to over my explorations of you know devotional or spiritual um history and activity in india uh i think there is so much material there and there's so much that we can look at with fresh eyes uh this would be very important look i mean i i want to mention one more thing to you mm-hmm. this always happens you know nations also work like human beings do on a maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy of needs yeah. yeah of needs triangle right when we are very poor you know or or when we don't have much access and so on and so forth in my parents generation the most important thing was to ensure livelihood to a particular level that was the firm first goal as we became more and more prosperous and the some of the basic stuff got sorted we then began to realize that oh there was more to life than this mm-hmm. and we had to the questions of who we really are you know before we began this conversation you were talking about how a lot of people became interested in streetwear and all these brands and and i remember that phase of india where you know people were wearing ed hardy t-shirts <laughs> and things like that very tacky still if you look at it perspective and i don't even know why they liked ed hardy yeah. literally i have a before or after that phase never heard of anybody talk about ed hardy mm. as asp- aspirational it died down so fast because i think everyone and anyone who made graphic tees or yeah or, uh, or like you remember like rock band tees yeah were just basically cheaper variations of the ed hardy because ed yeah. hardy would like double down on skulls double down on roses yeah. double down on cursive writing i really think it was it was made for bikers in america yeah and bikers in america made luxurious that indians somehow caught, caught wind of it was expensive and yeah. exclusive so they got it they looked shitty as fuck by the way right like because maybe we didn't have enough really graphic bad. tees no it was really and bad. then once the e-commerce revolution came around and everyone started like using yeah. indian slogans and 300 rupees 400 rupees ki t-shirts aane shuru ho gayi and had disappeared yeah 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 so so we had to go through this to come to this point yeah. you know and that's also a, a great spiritual lesson right i mean you have to go through life in order to reach somewhere mm-hmm. we had to as a nation go through all this clamor i still remember like lvmh coming to india being a really big thing and i always just think that you know a lot of these bags such as like canvas you know yeah. i mean uh, like in paris people wouldn't even be buying these canvas bags i mean they would be buying much 
better, higher end LV, yeah. if at all. Or actually, the French aristocracy would be buying things like Hermes. Mm -hmm. Right? So, but in India, of course, in South Delhi and whatever, there was this clamor for these monogrammed bags and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, we had to go through that phase. It was a phase. We had to go through that phase. And today, you know, everybody is now talking about Pashmina and this, that, yeah, and the other. Yeah. Returning to that. We're returning, returning, to, returning that. to, like we were mentioning, yeah. brands we were returning like raw, to that. raw mango, Piro, yeah. like logo-less, brand-less. You can't really pinpoint to a Correct. logo on all Correct. these things. And, 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 and they certainly look like they've come after a lot of churning, a lot of yeah. like uh, going through luxury mass consumer yeah. to things. I have a friend who makes one-of-one -one pieces. So you, he basically does... You sit with him and you give him his, your ideas and then yeah. he makes custom clothes for yeah. you using AI and everything else. His brand, called, brand is called My Morning, doing very well. And it's just, it's you've reached that level of consumer. It's like, I just want one of one. this. No one yeah. else can have it. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and if you think about it, this was always our tradition, right? I mean, even today, uh, the, the really discerning gentry, so to speak, people with wealth and a lot of culture and uh, history and so on and so forth, look for things like that, right? I mean... Uh, you know, they would look for that one thing that people don't buy. You know, mm. like, for I'll give you an example, right? People who really understand jewelry in this country don't go to Cartier. They go to Viren Bhagat in South Bombay. Now, Viren Bhagat is perhaps still, I mean, he used to be a few years ago, the only designer, jewelry designer in India to have been featured twice in the Rob Report. Okay. But Is very that a coveted few, report? The very report? Covet, yeah, very coveted. But very few people know about this because it's only South Bombay gentry and parts of Gujarat gentry, people with really very vast amounts of money and with a very discerning taste who know about Virain Bhagat. Hmm. So the South Delhi crowd don't even know about Virain Bhagat. Forget buying from him, right? They will go to their Bulgari and Cartier and so on and so forth, right? Hmm. And sadly, the stuff that they are buying from Bulgari and Cartier are the rock bottom stuff. They're not even buying the yeah. really crafted, you know, like people internationally who really understand jewelry would try and buy from Jar, right? They will not necessarily go to, you know, some, you know, Cartier or whatever. Yeah. So uh, my point is, I think we are rediscovering Many of the things, like I know families in Bengal who, you know, have traditionally had money. They will buy the finest muslin. Mm -hmm. They will know that one place in Murshidabad, that one weaver who will make that one unique thing for them. Mm. They will know that one, you know, whatever, like leather worker who will handcraft shoes for them. You know, I used to work with a man like that. You know, I think I learned a lot from him. Where, uh, where and what? Uh, uh, in Fortune. You know, okay. the man who owned Fortune, who had brought in oh, Fortune, part of a, you know, um, a newspaper chain. Uh, Avik Sarkar of the Ananda Bazar uh, Patrika group. Okay, Avik Sarkar of uh, ABP later That's on? right, Avik Sarkar. Uh, of Chiki Sarkar's father? Chiki Sarkar's father. Yeah, okay. So I had the pleasure of interacting with him, uh, you know, a few times when I used to work at Fortune. And, you know, he's a man of impeccable taste. The man always wears, either he wears a suit or he wears a dhoti kurta, you know. And Nicholas Coleridge, uh, as a young journalist, I read about him. Nicholas Coleridge wrote this book called Paper Tigers. And one part of it is about Indian press barons. And this was mm -hmm. like 20, 30, maybe even 40 years ago, 30 years ago, certainly. And there he wrote about Avik Sarkar that uh, the first six things that I heard about Avik Sarkar was, uh, what was it? He only accepts Bolivian or Colombian coffee. He <laughs> and there was a whole list, and where he yeah. plays tennis, which he does every day. He changes his Ralph Lauren T-shirt four times every set, and there was a whole list of these things. But you know, I mean, when I met the man, there was obviously an aura. But you realize that he's not looking necessarily to buy something that flashes out that he has money he will buy the things that he really wants. Mm. I remember Avik Sarkar once gave me like this, he spoke to me about this, how to select Rudraksh. Mm -hmm. I still remember this so distinctly. You know, and we were all sitting around and he taught us, you know, spoke to us about how to select Rudraksh, you know, what goes in. And it was fascinating. The other time he spoke to us about Balaposh. You know, Balaposh was in Bengal, the Nawabs used to have, wear, uh, have these, Bengal is not very cold in winter. But they're still chilly in the countryside uh, to a degree. So they have these very lovely quilts called Balaposh. 
each layer of the bala posh is made fragrant using burning incense under it for hours so that every layer of cotton is perfectly perfumed and then many many layers of that is stitched hand stitched to make one quilt so but but does, doesn't the fragrance go out after a while no that's why you have to do it for a long long time so that the very threads of the cotton has the smoke embedded in it has the smoke embedded in it that's crazy and then we went to try and find out and you know whether there's people doing original bala posh and i think there was on one family somewhere who was still doing it in that way yeah. so i'm saying the the people who know don't necessarily buy a lot of the stuff that you know like this delhi ncr <laughs> well buy yes. you know i have a few very uh, you know pertinent questions to ask about this so sure. um, <clears throat> i want to ask you about taste right yes. and i i i have this conversation with with many people in my audience younger yes. younger people particularly yes. right because i've had a very long journey with taste right yeah. my first few years you acquire the same books as everyone else reads of maybe you, you branch out a little bit i was lucky to have an interest in rock and roll because i randomly chanced upon yeah. the best of the eagles uh in thailand in a pirated yeah. cd shop for some reason and that allowed me to sort of weird away from my peers mm-hmm. and build a taste in rock and then for clothing i have friends books right a, a whole thing and now i look at the posters i would adorn my room with would be just you know drivel from websites uh you know classic rock and what not and i've seen over time i've like jordan peterson says you stumble on to taste you stumble mm-hmm. on to beauty it takes a while but then you have so much disdain for what you left behind because you're like oh my god i was doing this but do you not think that along the way you come and meet people who are so tasteful and so elegant that they completely change the trajectory of how much beauty you have in your life or how many things you adorn mm-hmm. your life with have you had people like that like like abik or or someone else who yeah. who who changed the way you you dress who changed the way you behaved who who allowed you to in a lot of ways you know become cultured no absolutely and um i think um you know what you're describing i mean you know i knew and know people in bengal like that again people who they're not all necessarily old money let mm-hmm. me say this they are people of learning who then happen to make money when they made money because they came from learning they knew what to do with the money i see they were not all people who began with money at all right um and i think that's a very interesting journey we always think that okay old money new world money clear division i don't think that's so pat at all i think there could be people who come with learning and then acquire some wealth and then they know what to do with that wealth right mm-hmm. uh you know many of my oxford professors were like that you know uh they didn't always come from money it's just that they had become with time you know then learning they had become oxford don so they'd become you know very well paid and so on and so forth and therefore they knew okay you know what did they want to drink they didn't want to drink what everybody was drinking you know mm-hmm. there was one thing that they wanted to drink and uh, what food they wanted and the particular thing that they wanted and so on and so forth i think taste is something that is always acquired there are some people who are privileged to have come from backgrounds where there was always taste so they sort of you know stumbled through up, yeah but you know there are a lot of people who come from such backgrounds also and become really like crass mm. that that also happens mm. so i think i would argue very strongly that taste is a byproduct of aesthetics aesthetics is a byproduct of learning by learning i don't only mean degree oriented learning but a certain kind of learning about the world for the lack of a better word let's just say societal wisdom or even just wisdom so taste what we call taste is only the final frontier but taste is a byproduct of aesthetics aesthetics is a byproduct of wisdom because what is aesthetics aesthetics is knowing not only what you want to consume but what you should consume right i remember uh, writing about you know uh, luxury in my fortune years there was a period where there was a huge battle between lvmh and hermes right and uh, i went to paris to talk to the hermes people and so on and so forth and lvmh was trying to you know take over hermes through like this whatever you know this this predatory move so to speak 
So I met the Hermes CEO and um, and I remember him saying, if LVMH takes over Hermes, within a year it will no longer remain Hermes. So I asked him, what do you mean by that? And he said, look, I mean, we never tell people you should buy many, many of our handbags or anything at all. Because we make products that will not only, if you keep them properly, last your lifetime, they are products you can bequeath to the next generation. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you should have, just because you have money, 40 of these products, say handbags, it's a ridiculous idea. Wow. The world does not have, if everybody wealthy started to consume like this, we would run out of precious leather. It's not sustainable. Yeah, so what they really invented heirloom luxury then. So it's, it's, it's what Patek Philippe argues, right? That you never own a Patek Philippe. You, you basically only keep it for the next generation. You're a trustee for the next generation. And I think we used to have that idea. Remember in our culture, even today, uh, you know, a lot of mothers would tell their children, I'm buying this for who you marry. Yeah, that's true. That's very common. They said jewelry is not necessarily only for me. I'm buying this so that when you get married, this will be handed over. Mm -hmm. That's also true for bridal wear, by the way. Of course. Yeah. So this was already in our culture. Because see, if we had to consume luxury the way the Americans consume luxury, hmm. it's impossible to sustain this. There isn't enough. I mean, I don't know. We would have to mass breed crocodiles and then slaughter them to get, I don't know, some strange thing. Hmm. We would not be able to get the precious skins with which a lot of luxury items in leather are made or mm. the wool with which a lot of precious, you know, wool material is made. I want to go back to something you said that was probably like it's a formula that, you know, you said that uh, taste comes from aesthetics, aesthetics come from learning. Yes. Right. Now I will lay out this scenario in front of you and, and help me understand. So you can help me understand this better. Sure. Let's talk about learning, right? Yeah. So we have a country where, People are generally disenfranchised with schools and colleges. I consider them necessary in the sense that give you a good place to start from, right? Because it's unlikely that we have a very robust homeschooling system or a family with all aristocrats and divine tastes where they can just sort of pass it on to you. Sure. There are many beautiful people with beautiful tastes who are bad yes. teachers, right? Or sometimes absent. Sure. So you've got schools. So people acquire some degree of learning in school. Then they also have interests. Mostly people either pursue a hobby to learn that more or they read books. Mm. I want to narrow in on books. Sure. I found that, see the average Indian young youth reads more self-help and business books mm. than they would care to read about history or aesthetics, right? Because it seems as a very frivolous pursuit mm. at a country that is now trying to grow itself. So I see so many of my friends, younger than me in most cases, very well established, far more disposable income with no taste at all and they ask me, even I'm how is it that you do this and do this? And I was like, I, I can't really answer. I've just like always read this thing that I want to read and, and be the person that I want to be. But I, I, I struggle with transferring it. Mm -hmm. So m when you talk about learning, what, you know, separates this from, uh, you know, the same bestseller around five ways mm -hmm. to make money and four ways to change your beliefs. So look, this is always a journey, right? We usually think of these things as destinations. We are going through a phase where already we have come out of that, you know, let's have everything monogrammed phase to a degree, right? Mm -hmm. But there are many young people in this country. We are now in a phase which I think will at least take another 20 years where many more people will ask themselves, who am I really? And then they will realize that who moved my cheese or, you know, you can win or whatever it is. By the way, Who Moved My Cheese is one of the most miserable books in I've never read it. history of mankind. Maybe, you know, I mean, it was... But it's one of those, you know, American self-help books, which is just, I don't know, it's about these cheese who move one cheese, mice which who move cheese from here to there. And it's about knowing that oh, opportunity has moved, therefore you have to move. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I was really poor, so I already knew that, you know? <laughs> I know, poverty taught me that, you know, I could have written who moved my cheese, you know, who moved my dal. Uh, it was just like, but we are going through, having said that, we are going through a phase where this upwardly mobile thing is very, very deeply enmeshed in us. 
it will take a little more time until people f- begin to understand that okay you can read all this you know how you can top how you can move this that all kinds of things mm. but you will still be dissatisfied because you will fundamentally not grow what i call a bearing mm. right and a bearing comes from an anchor somewhere and your anchor cannot be that i worked in mckinsey then i worked in bain then before that i was in evi and then my dad has x amount of money so therefore i went to i don't know timbuktu for a holiday sure you can do all of that but again when you return to your desktop or laptop on monday morning you will feel miserable because what you're doing is you're injecting that you know adrenaline rush from time to time mm-hmm. but you don't have an anchor you have no idea about who you are you're basically saying acha sab you know the other day somebody messaged me saying uh, what um, paris and london are no longer in the vogue uh, or in vogue uh, everybody is going to baku mhm i was like okay but uh, i mean even if you go to baku you might come back from baku and feel as unhappy on your laptop as you did coming back from paris it's just that you've you know shifted the location right right but fundamental things in you are not changing because your identity is not rooted to anything your identity cannot be that i drank i don't know if you can afford it blue label over the weekend yeah and uh, you know we used to skinny dip in i don't know like mozambique and now i'm in baku that that's not your identity it can never be your identity it's impossible and therefore you're seeing number of suicides among young are growing exponentially not just in india around the world you look at a whole bunch of ident look we are in we are in a world not only of technology but we are in a world of identity crisis Mm-hmm. you look at what's happening on identity on race mm-hmm. identity on gender identity on nationality all of these things identity on religion there is a global crisis of identity some people are trying to fix it with gender some are trying to fix it with race mm. some are trying to fix it with political ideology some with you know motivated spiritual ideology all kinds of things but that still doesn't give you the anchor and that anchor will come when you actually face the mirror and one day and ask so what am i really am i the same nightclub that everybody else goes to am i the same cars i mean in delhi for instance i was just saying this to somebody else even if i had the money which i don't but even if i had the money i would really never buy a bmw it's just the most boring thing to buy because it just reeks of a particular kind of city and a particular mindset where you think this will set me apart or this will help me fit in mm-hmm. but you may buy a bm actually i would i would much rather meet people who buy the bmw not as an identity marker but because it's great technology it's a great car yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but most people i at least know don't buy it because the engineering is so superb they buy it because it will tick another box right and it's that box ticking that you do to so much of that when you come back to yourself you feel very hollow and empty on the inside of course because that groundedness that anchor you're talking about it has to be like a deeper cause it could be like you want to dedicate yourself lifelong to learning to being a better human being it could be anything right it could be that you really care about animals i'm just giving yeah, an yeah, example yeah, yeah, yeah. no matter what you do you care about animals and you want to devote x amount of your time every week no matter what else is happening in your life to taking care of animals it doesn't have to be in some grand way maybe it's just two kittens in your house mm-hmm. maybe it's five strays outside your door right but that is a unselfish motivated un- uh, 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 an action driven by no selfish motivation which you're doing every day right see anchor comes from lack of selfishness it can never come from only transactional methodology right mm-hmm. see what is selfishness at the end of the day i will only do this if i get this so mm. i will appear for work every morning kyunki i will get this bonus at the end of the year usse main baku jaunga mm. i don't know why baku in my head but anyway <laughs> or i will buy that beamer or i will go and blow whatever like you know 
one lakh rupees dancing in some Gurgaon pub or whatever, right? <laughs> and sure, you could do that. Or I would buy a handbag of like whatever, right? But the point is, all those motivations are finally selfish. You're working to get that. What will happen if you do that? Your friends will say, Acha ha, tick, 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 tick. Mm-hmm. But if you take care of them, just saying, and even though that also people now become, you know, every day you'll post with some kitten and take photos saying, amazing, look, I am this great, whatever. Mm. But if you do one thing, one thing, which you don't need to exhibit, it therefore becomes a self, relatively selfless thing. It's sacred also. Of course it is. Because this portrayal, right, that I mean, Pranam Mukherjee used to do one hour of puja every morning for the whole of his life. That was one hour where even supposedly his party bosses couldn't call him. And certainly nobody in government could dare to call him. But, you know, he didn't take photographs from every angle of that and mm. say, today puja, Monday. Mm-hmm. Tuesday puja with new lighting. Look, <laughs> fresh hibiscus flowers on wetness day. Yeah. Right? So I'm saying you will only find an anchor if you do something which has no material benefit to you. One material benefit is in terms of a transaction. But remember, external validation itself is a transaction. Right? That's why people really worry. Are you going like karte the, aaj ek hi like kiya kisi ne. Story of our lives on, on the, this side of this. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mera ab ye likes kam ho ja hai. It, it, it generally, it to you and everyone else, it reflects as like a waxing and waning of your moon. Right? Yeah. Ki aapka, ya fir aapka sun abhi hai, abhi hai. And, and it's so weird because it's your work, right? So it's like two real time updates on your work. And it's not even like a a labor of love. I know a lot of creators who put in like hours making the perfect reel or the perfect like shot. But it's not to say that a book is better than like a, a no, not getting but, into that, but like it's just a brain fart. Sometimes yeah, it's just I like, mean, hi guys, mujhe aisa lag hai, blah, 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 blah. And it gets thousand likes. Great. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's not something that you spend. It's you're not Manji the mountain man where you spend 27 years, you know, uh, building a mountain road. So I think people take themselves a little too seriously in this. No, no, hugely seriously. And look, I mean, all of us go through this, right? I mean, like I no longer track at a very active level. And thankfully, you know, because of the work and stuff, I can afford not to. On, you know, necessarily how many people read my books or so on and so forth. I truly believe after 11 books that hopefully whatever I write, if it gets published, if it doesn't get rejected, we'll find an audience. Yeah, that's right? true. Now, that audience doesn't each time have to be some national bestseller. Mm. It may be smaller, but that smaller audience for that book may intensely engage with the work in a manner that many bestsellers may not engage. Right. It's better to have a cult than... Right. So it's possible. But I am making the strong argument that that anchor that people seek not only must come from within, it must come or it can only come from activity that does not seek validation or transaction. That you would do for free the rest of your life, even if no one was watching. If nobody was watching, you were getting nothing out of it. Nobody was coming and patting you on the back saying, amazing, amazing. Nobody was liking some post you made. Nobody was giving you money for it. You were not getting any social prestige. RWA ke aap chairman nahi ban jaoge uske leke. <laughs> You know, so you do that because you wish to do that. It makes Mm -hmm. you happy. So at the end of the book, you talk about, sorry, the last, second last chapter, you talk about the mouse charmer. Yeah. Right. And you talk about Modi because we we are living in the era of Modi, right? And it's very likely he's going to win the 2024 elections. So from all of the historical figures, you now have someone who's, the PM, yeah. right? And and yeah. it's not like PM Atal Bihari Vajpayee of, of no, the 90s India. No. This is India, third largest economy. For I'm not sure what the exact thing is. But like, we'll statistically, very soon. Yeah, statistically, with all the rankings and yes. whatnot, the India story, yeah. this is as powerful as a it PM could possibly yeah. be, right? And he also happens to be a champion of the political Hindu movement. Yes, He happens to be someone from the RSS fold, happens to be... You know, all the boxes check out as far as this ideology is concerned, right? Mm-hmm. What has he then enacted to push this forward? 
I think there are three things. I mean, I often say if if Mr. Modi did not exist, then one would have to invent Mr. Modi. Because, and I'll explain to you why one say, uh, says this, India needed a sort of figure who would tell us why we are great, why we places where we are not great, we can be great. What will change if we become great? This is important in every nation's history. I think because Mr. Modi comes from a background where he has cultivated a relatively solitary and, you know, in many ways, ascetic life for himself, he has a kind of focus that allows him to do this better than most other people. Mm -hmm. Because I think he translates these ideas that India is destined for greatness in very concrete terms and is able to explain to a very large amount of people in India and outside why India is destined for greatness. In, you know, in IR terms, we would call it the construction of the grand narrative for India. You know, rising powers need grand narratives. One of my upcoming works is India as a civilizational state, where I talk about this, that India needs a grand narrative. And that grand narrative in many ways has and is being constructed by Mr. Modi. And he is basing the India's grand narrative by talking about the fact that India had fundamentally many things going for it. See, what has happened before Mr. Modi was a lot of our positive national assessment came from the fact that, oh, we have a great uh, constitution, you know, which we do, mm -hmm. I agree. And we have non-violence, right? I mean, even though our society is full of violence, but actually there's something to hold up and so on and so forth. Modiji has been able to take that trajectory of sourcing our ideas of greatness far further into the past. And he then makes this argument that India is destined for greatness because India has these inherent strengths of culture. Mm. Those inherent strengths are not new. They're not only 70 or 75 years old. They come from the very foundation stones of our culture. And those we need to hold up. And that appeals to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Look, you also have to uh, inspire people to greatness. You know, I mean, that is one of the things that Gandhiji did well. Right. And that's why I have often said in my uh, lectures and writings that the one person who's learned most from Gandhi is Modi. He has understood that India, Indian culture respects a certain kind of asceticness, right, or asceticism. Um, he, of course, cannot do it in the way Gandhi did it. But he has brought in his own ideas in terms of promoting yoga, you know, promoting all kinds of things like, yeah. uh, you know, not just in India, but around the world in terms of the spread of cultural ideas. Now, some of these ideas, some may say are, oh, these are very simple things. And, you know, this has been uh, propagated heavily. Sure. But at the end of the day, we have to begin somewhere. And I think that beginning somewhere of India as a rising power, in a sense, had to happen via somebody. And that's why I say if we didn't have Modi, you know, we would have to invent him. Do you think that India is going to only have um, celebrate bachelor ascetic PMs no, as no, the time not, goes on? No, maybe, maybe not. No? Maybe not. Um, uh, yeah, um, absolutely. Maybe not. But remember, we have a history of solitary figures doing well as prime ministers. You know, Indira Gandhi famously was mm -hmm. a bit of a solitary figure, right? She had a family, but she's always, always seen as this you know, strong, lone, slightly lonely persona. Even Nehru, by the time he became prime minister, and especially as the years went by, cut a fairly solitary, I mean, his daughter was the only sort of, you know, mm -hmm. figure. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, Atal Bihari Vajpayee famously is an example. Um, you know, uh, in many ways, um, even Manmohan Singh, even though he had a structured family, uh, he had, by the time he became prime minister, become in political imagination a slightly aloof, you know, mm. slightly ascetic figure. Uh, you know, there was this whole promotion that he personally is not corrupt, whatever else happens around him and so on and so forth. But no, I don't think we always have to have a figure 
uh, who's a ascetic bachelor uh, without a family but i think in our culture this figure will be revered for much longer than we may like to imagine because we come from a long tradition of sadhus and sants and reverend reverence for people who give up in a sense joys of the material world in some shape or form hmm. we are a people who respects that you know in another country they may say oh well he doesn't have a family then uh, you know does he understand all the problems of the f- of having a yeah, family yeah look at america america's always family the, family 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 fam- the family is always at the forefront of including the family dog yeah the family dog i mean yeah. rishi sunak has that is two uh, yeah. dogs um, yeah but the obama trump even Ab- biden everyone's Clinton, family yeah. Yeah, is, is on the forefront of yeah. all coverage yeah. so we are not like that hmm. we are a country where this entire see the other day we were talking about this rajneeti comes from raj dharma mm-hmm. raj dharma is the dharma of a raja and what are the best kind of rajas they are the philosopher kings mm-hmm. remember so when we say philosopher kings we have had a whole history of even not just the philosopher king but even kings who are not philosophers so to speak seek refuge in the wisdom of these ascetic mm. characters right and i think we as a people respect the fact that especially in this phase of our national growth that if a person's full focus is devoted in a sort of unselfish way uh, only towards the nation uh, and nation building that's a good thing but remember this is also a by product of the nepotism that we have seen in our country there is a longer historical reason but we have also seen a lot of nepotism in our culture sure. you know in every field why just in politics you know you look at today bollywood is talking hindi cinema is talked about a lot mm-hmm. but look at indian business right in so many fields it's these families have captured a lot of space and i think these are the two reasons one is historical the other is more contemporary why we as a people perhaps think of this as a you know sort of ideal <coughs> i'm i'm going to read a few lines from the book Please. that stood out to me and uh then we will wrap up this uh this amazing amazing whirlwind of a conversation i know it's a fascinating conversation thank you i'm not going to read the entire passages but yeah. something that stood out to me what i liked a lot was a few key things one of the things you mentioned in the book was the makale mir and i mean yeah. am i pronouncing the word macaulay yes, rightly yes yes okay so the macaulay minute on indian education a class this is what he envisioned when he talked about the education yeah. system that the british or macaulay gave us yes. right a class who may be interpreters <coughs> between us and the millions whom we govern a class of persons indian in blood and color but english in taste in opinions in morals and yeah. in intellect to that class we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country to enrich those dialects with terms of science borrowed from the western nomenclature and to render them by degrees fit vehicles for conveying knowledge to the great mass of the population um the reason i bring this up uh is because i had a havan at my place a few years ago and you know for some reason some uh some pundits and my family were discussing just general stuff um and then one pundit randomly stood up and said you know all of these problems are happening because of macaulay is macaulay is sab kuch kharab kar raha hai and i was like who is this macaulay and so i didn't do too much research beyond knowing that us pandit ke hisab se macaulay ne kuch kharab kar raha hai until i discovered it in your book that's why i wrote it down no look i mean this is absolutely true i mean this is the history of uh, early um, you know british influence in india the british wanted to create a sort of clerical class so to speak you know who would be slightly more prosperous than the average person and who would be the interlocutors you know they would negotiate power between the vast masses and the british masters and they in a sense would be english in thought taste you know mm-hmm. uh, language refinement whatever they would be the ideal brown sahib so to speak right and the brown sahibs would in a sense help the british govern india Mm-hmm. and i think indians took that brown sahib idea a little too far you know we all embraced this idea and you know all we were to become brown sahibs and so on and so forth i think we are 
finally breaking away from that. I'll give you one example. Do you know when 20, in 2014, when Narendra Modi first came to power and won the election uh, to become prime minister, The Guardian wrote an article, an editorial, The Guardian newspaper in England, right? Mm -hmm. Where they said, this may be finally that moment when the British finally leave India. <laughs> because remember, Pandit Nehru famously said that he was the last Englishman to rule India. It's a very famous statement by uh, okay. Jawaharlal Nehru. He said, I am probably the last Englishman to uh, rule India, to govern India. Because uh, he was, uh, you know, aristocratic of, uh, you know, uh, in his family life and, you know, from in his pedigree, so to speak. He had essentially uh, been nurtured in a perfect English style, right? By nannies at home and, you know, whatever, governesses and so on and so forth. And then when he went abroad to study in England, he had become, you know, in many ways, the perfect English gentleman, right? Um, so, um, you know, uh, this, this is a very deep-seated cultural anxiety among us, right? I think we're finally getting rid of this. Uh, but this is, you know, when they talk about decolonization, this is what it means, you know, that you yeah. shed the trappings of colonial. You no behavior. longer become the interlocutor. No. Today, we look at our country through our own eyes, good, or bad or ugly. Mm -hmm. We are not de determining our country on the basis of what somebody else says. Think about it. I'll give you an example. Have you ever heard that an Indian has written a book about America or England, which is really being discussed as the truth about that country? Mm, almost never. Never. Mm -hmm. Until recently, a large number, number one, the West wrote infinite number of books about them. Every foreign correspondent who would land up in Delhi after two months would write a book about India. Mm. And we would hold up those books as the example of what India really is. Yeah. Today, you try to go to England. You know, I studied in America. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling my agent, oh, maybe I'll write a book about America. She immediately said, actually, I don't think the publishers here would be, would, would be interested. Because what would you understand of America in just one or two years? Where were you studying in America? At Columbia. At Columbia, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's... Think about it. I mean, today, if I go to, uh, you know, say, oh, well, I've cited Oxford, I will write a definitive uh, volume on what England is and what its future should be. Do you think anybody in England would well, care? Well, they will only let it let you do it if you write it from a brown lens where you shit on the English. No, and, and, and certain for, publications. And number one, they will mostly not let me do it at all. They don't care. Yeah. Even if I manage to do it, nobody would care. We were a country where we would take every white-skinned person's opinion on India and hold it up as that, ye to sahi hai. this is the mm. truth about our country. Which is a real, like, I mean, our cultural anxiety was huge. It was really, really huge. And I think we are finally breaking away from it. Uh, and I, for one, could, couldn't be more delighted. Uh, it was high time. Because we really look at our country completely using that lens. You know, in being Hindu, I quoted this wonderful African writer who has now passed away. Um, he wrote about how to write about Africa, you know, this famous essay. And he wrote about all the tropes that the Westerners write when they write about Africa. All the Africans have to be native intelligence. There has to be animals roaming around. The dusk has to be, you know, as if there's nothing else apart from that in Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's orientalized at a whole different level. It's the same with us, right? I mean, you know, we had people, you know, people like Wendy Doniger and others you know, who would come to India and all they would see is, I mean, actually, Wendy Doniger I, could not understand anything about Hinduism apart from sex and oppression. These were the only two themes she took away from like, I don't know, 5,000 years of Hinduism. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, I don't have a problem with that. Also, that's mm -hmm. her opinion. I don't have to accept it. But if you tell me that that is the final authoritative word on my faith, then I have a problem. Then I have to write back in response. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, then I have to really say that, look, I mean, actually, no. Let an Indian write about what India really is. In fact, let hundreds of Indians write about it and mm -hmm. then come to some common consensus, if at all. So we had become very determined only to accept the white man's gaze or the Western gaze 
on what India is. Yeah. Also, I think when code switching goes away yeah. from from how we speak our yeah. English. I mean, this happened to me when I was trying to fit into America. Yeah. I acquired yeah. and that accent, and I really, really enjoyed when. some my american peers would come and say to me you know you, which state are you from i was like oh, that's a that's a sign of pride <laughs> and then i had a little spiritual encounter and i decided to go back to that indian tongue or at least yeah. find whatever it was and blend sure. it with who i who i had become sure and i spoke to my uh, housemates after several years over a zoom call and i was surprised to notice that i didn't code switch code switch at all this time and i mean maybe it's a very small thing but no it, no it, but these things matter and these things these small things they're not small at all they give you a much wider idea of what's going on with that person hmm. you know and what's going on in society so the fact that even pe- uh, indians who study abroad if they can look accent is a very subjective thing yeah. but if you if you feel comfortable that the ecosystem in your country is now supporting yeah uh an indian who is truly independent and sovereign in international spaces to yeah. hold their ground as someone who has equal or perhaps even better stature sure as opposed to i'm going to accommodate the the white man or the western man um in speech in language and when i'm too shy to sh- show my competence let me be over hospitable mm-hmm. because i'm doing some service uh, because i know my culture is to be hospitable when those sort of things go away and when you proudly proclaim who you are and stand mm-hmm. your ground that's a time when i mean i really think that's that's where this revolution this political hindu identity also goes abroad to the diaspora yeah i agree with you i think uh, this is a very important point and i think uh, this is what cultural confidence is all about you know uh, where you don't feel bad that you know your leaders are not speaking in english abroad why should they Mm. Does the Japanese, uh, the do do leaders from Japan speak in English? Putin outside? never speaks in English. Does Putin ever speak in? Do the Chinese speak in any other language but Chinese? Uh, you know they don't care, and um, you know why should we? Um, in fact, I think it's great that more and more ambassadors in India are now trying to learn Hindi. Yeah, yeah. You know, all these years we have always you know judged people saying is ki Angrezi thik hai ki nahi and so on and so forth. you know our cultural confidence was really low i think we are rebuilding look this will take time it's just the beginning of the journey i would say mm-hmm. at least 20 30 years more for our cultural confidence to come to a particular point and all of this only comes with prosperity you know no poor country has cultural confidence yeah mm. ye nahi ho sakta you know you can't have cultural confidence and be extremely poor that's just not a combination that works well we actually tried this combination after independence that oh no 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 we are uh, you know non aligned and this that and the other theek hai i mean it may be worked in a few places but broadly it does not work and it cannot work for a long time people call you a bluff that you know you are a country full of you know you're asking for aid from us constantly mm. what cultural confidence a beggars cannot have cultural confidence right <laughs> you know you know beggars have no cultural confidence or any confidence for that matter so therefore once we start being a beggar you know now we are a net provider of aid Uh, not really net, yeah yeah india we send now, foreign aid to other countries yeah yeah we are a net net provider of aid we are no longer a net recipient of aid we send out more aid than we receive that's crazy and yeah. I, ne- i never thought i would see that day it's true it's happened and see the thing is uh, even the, you know the, sometimes in british parliament they say oh we are still giving aid to india they are giving scholarships and aid to india not because we need that money they are giving it so that those scholarships help them access new generations of exciting indian minds who they might recruit for the growth of their country we're not asking them for aid no no not at all we are not begging to anybody for aid anymore not at all what we now ask for is technology transfer hmm. which i think is absolutely relevant and we are very correctly saying if climate transition has to happen then the global north has to give money because you're asking the global south to make this transition which is entirely transformative of economy how will we do it overnight hmm. you have polluted the atmosphere for decades and centuries so you give you know equity the, we call it climate equity and climate finance you provide the climate finance to the global south you know it, there has to be equity in this one day you cannot wake up one morning and say no no now everybody change are yeah yeah because i think i i heard some some uh, intellectual talk about this where he said that 
it's very unfair for America to suddenly wake up and say everyone go green when, yeah. when you've had your industrialization and now Correct. you're at that level where you feel like we must be more sustainable Absolutely. but India and China are trying to grow and how will we feed our people how will we pull millions of people out of poverty if we don't do large scale manufacturing i'll give an example right we have to do large scale manufacturing people used to say oh you know that actually the buses passed the buses passed that's rubbish hmm. we are we have shown with mobile phone manufacturing no buses passed buses are constantly coming and going so uh, we barely had mobile phone manufacturing in our country we have now become second largest manufacturing i mean i have seen two years ago we barely had toys exports look at our toys exports today so we need that manufacturing to ensure that millions of people transition and they have a livelihood and so on and so forth now for you to come and tell us that no 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 you can only do this like this even today our per capita emission is a fraction of a fraction of what's there in the west Hmm. even today in fact if all indians began to consume like americans there would be no world left so therefore in order for us to make a transition we want to make a transition but the global north must help the global south i mean yeah. this is thank god the uh, big mac didn't make it to the mcdonald's indian menu <laughs> <laughs> we were very happy with those really small burgers one last thing before, before and I, about cultural yeah. confidence yeah. we are the only country where we have forced mcdonald's to produce vegetarian burgers that's true that is true that is an anomaly across the world um one word you mentioned yeah. um uh was indo futurism yes one of my new projects yes yeah new projects amazing yeah. so i have a little glimpse to offer you um sure. one of my friends madhav kohli is on twitter yeah he he's a big ai artist at when uh, dali and all of these things were coming around now he's mid journey i think maybe you have seen his work yeah so he got in a lot of controversy because of uh, he he let ai make uh, representations of uh one person from every state and, and oh they, yeah that's yeah, how, yeah, that's yeah. how i've seen his work yes yeah yeah so he he went to college with me um he made a one thread of indian temples of the future and they were it, it, they look like like religious space cities it was Amazing. so beautiful to see them i'll see this huh? so so when i read indo futurism yeah that's the word that came to my mind yes so when you talk about indo futurism yeah, what is it that do. span yeah so i'm writing a book about this it's called indo futurism I am making the argument that while we talk about India's technological prowess today and it is true India is taking leaps of technological prowess the UPI is one great example digital health this that and the other it is not true that this is a rare phenomenon in India ki abhi ho raha hai hmm. if you look at the broad span of indian history technological leaps were always part of india's history allow me to explain even today we don't know how the brihadeshwara temple was built no one can explain to you how did they build that how did the cholas build that even today very close to where you and i are sitting in delhi and cr in the national capital region no one can tell you how did they get the iron which never rusts in the qutub minar mm. we don't know we have no answers right Let me give you another example. If you read the history of the Crusades, right? There's a lot of talk about the sword of Saladin mm. made of Damascus steel. Damascus steel did not come from Damascus. Damascus steel came from today uh, from an area which we today called the Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu from Telugu people. In India they invented a kind of by beating steel a kind of a kind of composition of steel which would be so supple that you could bend it a sword mm. and yet so powerful that it could cut a human being half i have you seen the video of where they compare a katana with the with a bendable indian sword yes have you yes. seen that yeah 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 have yeah. you seen how the reviewer is saying i'm not too sure about the bendy quality yeah. of this but the cut from that sword is much better on the watermelon exactly so what was it was made of wood steel what is known as wood steel right we still don't know how to make that steel so india always had these leaps of faith you know one of the videos i uh, you know made with a friend was on ujjain you know long before i just the, came from ujjain the mahakaleshwar temple that's just, right yeah. but why is the so here's the question to ask you why do you think the mahakaleshwar temple is in ujjain uh, i have no idea i just got there on a, on a night trip and came so, out so mahakal is the lord of time like shiva is also the lord of time mahakal you know kal is time right now is it a coincidence that that temple sits in ujjain 
through which passed the Ujjain meridian, which before the Greenwich meridian is the center of the world, is the center, the, the, the focal point of time. So long before the Greenwich meridian came into being through which we measure global time, time used to be measured using the Ujjain meridian. And is it a coincidence, I ask you, that the temple of Mahakal, the Mahakal form of Shiva, happens to be in Ujjain? What does that say about our culture to you? Wow. So I make the argument that we had a history of understanding technology and science. We had a long history of understanding technology and science. You know, uh, in India, of course, people are mad. Let's talk about rhinoplasty, okay? Mm-hmm. Do you know rhinoplasty, which is taking skin and grafting, you know, no skin, using mm -hmm. grafting using... No. That surgery, the so skin surgery using grafting, happened first in southern India. Where did I learn this? Not in India. I was at Columbia University. I was looking at some material. I suddenly found an entry that spoke in detail about this. That's this kind of skin grafting surgery first happened in India. So technology and Indo-Futurism talks about how we are not technologically advanced today. We have a culture of technological advancement. It's just that we have forgotten all about this. Mm. We don't know anything about this. We were never taught about this. So cultural confidence that we were talking about does not come from thin air. It comes from understanding your culture. And to understand your culture means to understand these things. So therefore, my humble request is that before people go and tweet, they should read. You know, I keep saying <laughs> read before you tweet, you know. Uh, you know, and that's where the cultural confidence will come from. And that's why, you know, all of us are uh, doing exciting work uh, in our different fields uh, to make it happen. I'm excited to be an Indo-Futurist. I, I had no idea. I mean, I'd, when I went to Jen, I heard about some taxi driver told me, you know, to not to talk about taxi driver, driver journalism. So I didn't, I took what he said with a grain of salt, but he, he said that, uh, uh, sorry, my, it was my dad, my dad, who said that, do you know, Ujjain is the center of India. It's the midpoint of India. That's what he said. But we didn't take it to as being the midpoint of the world. Uh, but that's very interesting. Um, so there's, there was something called the Ujjain Meridian. Mm -hmm. So, so may, maybe, maybe I think, I think what I also took from this is maybe people should look up stuff and read rigorously. And and I think yeah. one of the reasons people don't uh, is because it, it, there, there's a fringy political flavor to all of these things, which yeah. deters people from engaging with scholarship. But you know, this fringy, I mean, here's the thing. Maybe there is a fringy element, but there's a fringy element to everything. Right. There was a fringy element in the past also. Mm. I am saying that actual pe people who are interested are engaging. Much more should be done. Everybody cannot read books. Some people may not be interested. Now we have lots of platforms. There could be video. There could be conversations like this. There could be live events and talks. There could be many things. Mm -hmm. But a, a book format is an interesting format because it stays. You can go back and refer to it. Right? You can put footnotes and endnotes and sources to it. Right? In case people want to check. But overall, I think we should create much more material, including many more books to mm -hmm. ensure that at least these generations and future generations have some idea of where we come from. So when they reach that point in life where they begin to ask, who am I really? You know, Hinduism has only three questions. Only three questions worth answering, according to Hinduism. If you read all of Hindu thought and philosophy, broadly there are three questions, only three questions worth answering. Who am I? What do I want? And what is my purpose? Now, most of us are going to be stuck in question number one all our lives. Because mm -hmm. remember, that changes. If I asked you, who, am I, who are you at the age of five? Very different from when you're 10. Very different from when you're 15. And very different from when you're 27, like you mm -hmm. are today, right? So it changes at various phases of your life. Now, of course, people who are enlightened go on to ask, you know, what is my purpose? Uh, and so on and so forth. But who am I, what do I want, and what is my purpose are the only three things. And when people begin to ask that, there should be enough material for them to go to, to that can help them answer that question. Well, That's I hope 
I hope that people can get soul and sword the history of political Hinduism by Hindol Sen Gupta who's sitting uh, across me to answer that question or to start that journey right and of course you've written several other books where can people find this book if they want to get it on any major bookshop and of course there's Amazon okay amazing and I just want to say uh, I think the conversation was delayed for a right reason I I call this providence but because uh the context for today was amazing and and it was absolutely my pleasure to have a conversation with you today it was great fun it's uh, definitely one of the most expansive conversations i've done i've done many of them but i think um you were able to touch upon many many themes that i think of are of common interest and i really ha- enjoyed having such an expansive and yet detailed conversation and i thank you for inviting me thank you so much thank and uh, where can people follow your work beyond the books is there a twitter or a linkedin twitter yeah like i mean you know i am on twitter as at @hindolsan gupta on linkedin of course mm-hmm. on facebook uh, and of course on instagram in everything @hindolsan gupta amazing amazing thank you for your time thank you for your time